I feel so empowered as a vegan activist. Since going vegan I am starving. For more knowledge on how to save the planet from the deadly and real hashtag climate crisis through grassroots, not co-opted controlled opposition, hashtag activism and hashtag climate action. One thing, um, which is that you mentioned 130 trillion dollars. Right? 105, I think it is. 105. I have 130 trillion dollars in my mind because mm. that is the amount of assets under management that are going to be handed over in the next five years to the millennials. And in a way, that, that to me is maybe some real hope because money is going to have to be invested in those green projects. I can sleep comfortably knowing that the grown-ups at the World Business Council for Sustainable Development, the IMF, the UN and World Bank are working hard to educate you all and bring solutions to the real and imminent hashtag climate crisis that is our fault for being alive and not sterilizing ourselves and not listening to the superior people on the television screen. I want to be a socially acceptable and approved global citizen like all the activists at the Free Global Citizen Festival in New York City, so I did some research on what the amazing 16-year-old human shield Greta Thunberg wants us to do for hashtag climate action. Uh, Greta, would you, um, could you please uh, tell us what kind of message, what you are doing here today, what kind of message would you send by doing this to world leaders? and? Also, can I ask you, um, do you think it's about time that um, uh, President Trump would respond to what you have uh, said today? Um, I think... I'm sorry, what was the first question? <laughs> What's the message you would like to yeah. send to our leaders yeah. by doing what you are doing? I think what we want to send is, the message we want to send is to say that we have had enough. And uh, anyone else wants to ask them that question? I can't speak on behalf of everyone. Anyone wants to answer about the message to world leaders? Mm -hmm. I think maybe you should give some questions to the others as well. What a bully. Why how comes did the mean grown up pick on that poor innocent 16 year old human shield? I don't hate children. I am not a bigot. I want hashtag climate action now and if that's not clear enough I let the World Resources Institute answer those grown up questions. Bill Gates is a major benefactor of the Extinction Rebellion movement and close friend of philanthropist champion of science, Jeffrey Epstein. He is a grown up who knows our house is on fire and he is warm warning us that we need to take hashtag climate action by helping the philanthropists at the IMF and World Bank to give sustainable loans that help destabilize nations in places where there are all those extra people. We can help these uneducated climate change driving extra people to help us to stop the hashtag climate crisis by giving their resources to global corporations and banks who can then educate them on institutionalized infanticide and make them grow GMO crops so we enlightened vegans can import it for our nutrient fortified plant based kibble. The Africans ought to get to decide which crops they grow in which, which ways and which seeds. The strongest analogy is to medicines. And, you know, is there something to worry about with medicines? That is, might some of them have side effects? Do we need safety testing? I mean, and we're taking things that are, you know, genetically modified organisms and we're injecting them in the little kid's arms. We just shoot them right into the vein. So, yeah, I think maybe we should have a safety system where we, you know, do trials and test things out. Uh, the idea, though, that you would take a technique uh, that promises to solve nutrition problems, uh, solves uh, productivity problems, solves crop disease problems for African farmers, where it's absolutely a life and death issue for them. And you would, you would say, oh, nothing that uses that technique uh, should possibly use. And it's so random, the, what's considered in, 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 
GMO and what's not considered GMO, irradiating things. I trust this grassroots organizer, Bill Gates, friend of philanthropist Jeffrey Epstein, knows what's best. I am not afraid of science and progress. It's too complicated for me and I am too confused to come up with my own opinions. I let the grown-ups like Bill Gates and Jeffrey Epstein do the hard thinking. I hope Greta Thunberg told Obama, when they met, that he and John Podesta should use vegan Beyond Meat hot dogs next time they need $65,000 of hot dogs from Chicago for a private party at the White House. That will help Bill Gates and global financiers fight the hashtag climate crisis emergency even more better. Hey, what's that gadget? Global citizens breaking news. Some naughty indigenous animal abusing non-vegan troublemakers in Ecuador are making bad time for good grown-up President Moreno who has declared a state of emergency that removes limits to government power and allows full censorship of all media in the country. These bigots making it hard for Moreno to help the planet don't know that they must want sustainable IMF loan dictated austerity measures to make them austere. They don't understand that it will save the planet if these extra unnecessary people pay more for fuel so their government can sell off all the nation's fuel, minerals, water, and land to the Fortune 100 corporations and members of the World Business Council for Sustainable Development for pennies. These President Moreno-phobic bigots should focus on the good news, that they get to pay more than twice as much for fuel and they'll get discounts on Bayer Monsanto pesticides and microfinance loans from the World Bank and Bill Gates to buy mandatory pharmaceutical products for their children's health and industrial machines that can destroy their soil and cover it in nutrients like pesticides, herbicides and fungicides so they can grow sustainable patented corn instead of the thousands of varieties of local heirloom foods. This is what's best for them, and the planet. I just wish Moreno would adopt mandatory veganism for these Ecuadorians. These indigenous people don't know a plant-based diet is what is best. I'm hoping Moreno and the UN help us animal rights activists to stop them from keeping chickens, goats, sheep, and cows because they have a lot of able-bodied people who could be growing soy and corn for me. Earthling Ed, Joey Carbstrong and the rest of the newly formed Animal Rebellion. We will update you more on this developing situation in Ecuador as things develop. I'm exhausted and need a nap. All this rebellious and trendy cool vegan activism is so cutting edge. Tomorrow me and my new friends at Animal Rebellion are going to take over a massive meat market in London and the government and police will likely do absolutely nothing but temporarily detain a few of us. We are so excited, it will be so lit. We cannot wait to force everyone to go vegan to save the planet. First me and Joey Carbstrong, another vegan activist will take hashtag climate action and go shopping for some plant based kibble. After my mid morning nap I feel so happy and nourished, empowered, and satiated for purchasing a sustainable lunch of shrink wrapped plant based pesticide fortified GMO kibble from patented GMO wheat grown by Africans paying off massive IMF loans thanks to the Rockefeller Foundation and Bill Gates brave generous philanthropy. This sustainable mass produced kibble is so much tastier and more nourishing and more ethical than real food. I don't miss animal foods at all. I am completely content with this lifestyle. Super easy to be vegan in most places on earth. Um, that's the chip section. Don't even know if we want to go down there. Do we? Not really. I don't really go down there. Oh, except if you ever get any of this. We love the love corn. This stuff here, even though it's fried in oil, good for a little treat. <laughs> These are vegan too. Look like I can't actually eat too much granola because it's so tasty. But Jordan's, you're pretty, just check, the, with, when it comes to buying cereal, just check for honey. We don't want to exploit bees. So these Jordan ones are pretty good. Jordan Crisp and in here. These are vegan, I've only just seen these. They look pretty good, amazing. Let's have a look over here on the back of this. Um, sugar, rice flour, emulsifier, wheat flakes, maple syrup flavoring. Look, 
They're made out of plants, all right? So, just took me one second to realize that as well. Healthy stuff. I eat lots of oats. I eat so much oatmeal. It's, getting, it's crazy. I am so mentally healthy and happy like this vegan activist. It is acceptable to me to eat so much oats all the time and never eat real animal foods again. The World Business Council for Sustainable Development member corporations make the best Roundup fortified GMO plant-based kibble that makes my tummy smile pretty colors inside. I've learned so much about how to purchase and consume sustainable kibble from this dope and lit activist, Joey Carpstrong. He taught me that McDonald's is helping us to save the planet from the hashtag climate crisis and the animal howler cost. Um. I care about the animals and the environment. Uh -huh. I care about my health. If it ain't vegan, I ain't buying it. I care about the planet. If it does, then we go die with it. People hating veganism without even trying it. All right, so here we are in UK McDonald's. Yes, that's right. We're in McDonald's. I know I'm a vegan, but there's some stuff at the UK McDonald's that you can get that is vegan friendly, okay? The fries, they're not fried in any of the oil, so you don't have to worry about cross-contamination. I think they're fried in grapeseed oil or something like that. But then we've got the burger, okay? So the burger, this is a, a veggie deluxe with no mayonnaise, no mayonnaise, no cheese, and it's got, I uh, add tomato sauce instead of the mayonnaise. This is vegan friendly here in the UK. Also, um, the apple pie. So the apple pie is vegan here in the UK. I've got a Sprite here. Now, we prefer them to not use plastic, so to say I don't want any plastic, we carry around our little glass straw. Boom. So anyone who's worried about buying vegan options at McDonald's, I wouldn't worry about it. I would support the vegan options where you can. Let them know that you're vegan at McDonald's, because if they bring a McVegan burger out, like you don't have to alter the vegetarian burger, you can just bring a uh, they bring a specific McVegan burger out, that would be amazing for animals. That is so amazing for the animals. I can't wait to save the planet by eating McDonald's when I fly to the UK to join the animal rebellion that I learned about from Plant Based News and Joey. Let's learn more about how to be an empowered grassroots hashtag vegan activist from this mentally and physically healthy role model. Now it's time. It's time for us to ri rise up and rebel. Rebel in solidarity with animals and against the climate crisis. To join forces with Extinction Rebellion and highlight the injustice of animal agriculture and the contribution it makes to climate change. We cannot end the climate emergency without first declaring the animal emergency. The establishment elite are so afraid of this grassroots extinction rebellion against the real and imminent death threats from the hashtag climate crisis emergency that the global media company Forbes says pension funds, NGOs, governments, and big banks should invest trillions of dollars in sustainable finance and support these badass rebellious and cool rebels in their quest to save the planet by getting rid of all the toxic CO2 emitting disgusting humans who won't listen to the people on the TV and stop breeding and using resources. But it's those who currently perpetuate these systems of violence who could one day be the same people to end them. We need to tell them why. We need to educate them. We need to show them. That is why we're here today. I am trembling and tingling from listening to this effeminate gelfling named Earthling Ed. The not co-opted and truly anti-establishment animal rebellion and extinction rebellion will stop the climate crisis and give delicious sustainable nutrient fortified plant-based replacement food and IMF loans and conditions to all those CO2 producing Africans and South Americans who are ruining the climate with their toxic babies and their livestock. I am so glad that these youth are fighting with the grown-ups at the Rockefeller Foundation, the UN, Bayer Monsanto, Unilever, Kellogg's, Ikea, Walmart and the World Bank to save the planet. But we are rising. We are stronger than we have ever been. And we will 
see that vegan world because we will not stop until we make it happen. I'm exhausted and hungry from laughing in the streets with all these woke ass divorced promiscuous wine moms and boomers, petulant pilled out millennials, and vacant zoomers. I haven't eaten in under an hour. Let's take some hashtag climate action now and have an unnecessary late night vegan snack made by third world debt slaves. I feel so good about helping those CO2 off gassing extra people over there who make my food to decrease their atrocious carbon footprint. The IMF loans that allow them to grow the GMO plants for my cheap, high markup fortified cable will save the planet from the toxic human babies by destabilizing their countries with a repressive puppet government police state, and making them poor and desperate so they give their minerals, water, land, and resources to the corporate members of the World Business Council on Sustainable Development for pennies. I hope Bill Gates Foundation provides them with microfinance for reproductive health services infanticide as well. Maybe plant-based news has a new fake vegan cheese recipe to help me suppress this nagging feeling that I'm being deceived and used by a giant global marketing campaign for a high-tech Bolshevik, Maoist-style revolution on behalf of the Fortune 100 and global finance. I actually came here this morning to call out the racism that is inherent in the U.S. dietary guidelines. Drinking milk is racist. I'm not a bigot. I feel so good about my vegan activism. This is what is best for everyone. I am fighting the man. I am not being duped. I am not a useful idiot being co-opted by something I am too ignorant, self-indulgent, and distracted to understand. I just need some truly enjoyable vegan comfort products that mimic real animal foods with plants grown by the extra people who the grown-ups on the TV taught me need to stop existing. This will stop me from thinking so much and numb me to reality so I can take more hashtag climate action. Today we're going to be cooking up Mexican pizzas, really delicious. So the first thing we do is make a spicy bean mixture. So Mexican pizzas are in a sense a nice crispy tortilla with a spicy bean mix and then it's got the cheese. Oh, wow. The beans on this pizza are probably so acceptable. I bet I will not even desire real sausage after I take some prescription pills and overeat this Taco Bell style fake plastic plant cheese pizza in my smart city coffin apartment. Amazing. This is so acceptable to eat and so much more nourishing to me and the planet than real animal foods. I am not lying to myself when I say I like these Roundup fortified GMO corn tortillas from sustainable Monsanto seeds grown by the extra people in Mexico fried in GMO soil from patented seeds grown in Brazil and processed in China. This is really so much better than a fatty steak seared in butter, or real pizza with real cheese and meat on it. I do not want to eat real animal foods. I am empowered and not starving for real nutrients. I don't think it's hypocritical that plant-based news, promoters of the hashtag animal rebellion that wants to force the end of all animal food consumption, does sponsored recipe videos with this fake vegan cheese made by a company that makes real cheese from milk. The fake plastic plant cheese is what everyone needs to eat to save the planet. I feel good about this. I am not trying to convince myself that I enjoy this. Gas and bloating are normal and fun and cool. If I eat this way a few months more I will stop craving real animal foods and will save the planet. Vegans don't look unhealthy and sickly, those are just the ones who are doing it wrong. Vegans who say this diet ruined their physical and mental health were never really vegan and did it wrong. We can produce more calories from plants than animals on the same amount of land if we take everyone's land and make them grow plants. Eggs are murder. Unborn human babies are just clumps of cells. I am not being deceived, I am not mentally and physically destroying myself and the world around me with this fake plastic cheese diet and toxic weaponized pop culture. Hot, but great. Hope you enjoyed watching that video. All of the ingredients, all, everything you need for all the recipes is just down there. Applewood cheese, it's out now, isn't it? It's definitely got my vote. Brilliant. I'm going to finish this off. Thanks for watching. Bye. There you go. The mic is on this time.
What's up, bigots? Hesher, Tommy. Who else? We got a bunch of big bigots in the chat. A bunch of you regulars. I see some new names in here. You guys make sure to like it and share it. Because you know YouTube's not going to share this one. Um, we got a lot, of t a lot, a lot, a lot on our plate today. A lot more than just fake plastic vegan cheese made from plants. The fake, pl fake plastic plant-based cheese. So Honest AF, LBC Orca, Mia. Well, it's cracking, everybody. We got all kinds of stuff going on in the world today. I hope everybody's doing well. I hope everybody is informing on their neighbors. We got some people from California up in the chat. I hope you guys are out there uh, being good global citizens and joining the contact tracing army that Gavin Newsom has recently announced. <laughs> contact tracing, guys, because this is the reality that we're supposed to now accept, isn't it? This is what we're supposed to accept. Contact tracing. Contact tracing. Here we go. Here we go. All right, you guys, make sure to support this stream. If you enjoy what you see, send them super chats. If you guys got questions, if you just want to send some love to the channel over here, we get massively demonetized by YouTube. And we've recently found out that Google even hides. If you search Primal Edge Health YouTube on Google, Google shows other people's hit piece videos about us, but they don't even show our own channel now. So it is what it is. You know, we're just a small channel here, but I'm honored to be on the, to be on, so deep in that naughty list. All right, you got Hesher from the, uh, Hesher from the Boiler Room here. What's up with Boiler Room, dude? I haven't been on in a few weeks. You guys, you guys doing any daytime shows? We gotta do some daytime boiler room sometime. I can't, I just can't stay up so late. Tommy Kelly, formerly Tofu Tommy, sending 199 pounds, sending this non-essential channel his essential pounds from over there in the UK. Tommy used to be Tofu Tommy. He used to be in with all these vegan activists. So I always love seeing your name pop up in there. Tommy, really appreciate the support, dude. Um, so, you guys... How's everybody doing out there? What do you guys think about this so-called new reality? The new normal, as they're calling it. <laughs> How do you guys feel about submitting to this? If you see, I've got pulled up here a picture from Wuhan, China. This picture was floating around. We had CNN go to Wuhan. We had Bloomberg did an article on Wuhan and the new normal in Wuhan. Trying to normalize this new normal for us. The picture are the pictures of a bunch of Chinese communist slaves. Right? A bunch of Chinese slaves sitting eating their kibble. Eating their kibble from in between, doing whatever jobs it was that they're doing. They look like they work in some sort of an office. They're eating their kibble and they've got this plastic cardboard. Cardboard plastic covered divider in between them. And it's got three symbols on it. The first one is a, te a chat message, a text chat message, crossed out, no texting, no talking to each other, right? The next one is a clock to remind you that you're on the clock. Eat your food and get the hell out of here. And then the next one is wash your hands, right? Wash your, wash your, wash your hands. Everybody be afraid of the invisible enemy and the germs that are everywhere. And this is what they say Wuhan is like, subconsciously suggesting to you and I that this is the reality that we're going to have to accept, that this is how our children are going to live, because this is what they say is the new normal. What do we get? What do we get if we accept this new normal? What do we get? We get more of this. If we sit down, if we shut our mouths, and if we cheer on the essential twerkers of TikTok, if we non-essentials, that they've just branded us, they've called us non-essentials. If we accept this as the new normal, this is what we get. And they're openly telling us this. They're telling us that this is what we will get. We get to eat our kibble, separated, so we can't even see the person that's right next to us or in front of us, unable to speak to them, texting on our cell phones. 
They tell us that this is normal. They also showed pictures. Uh, they showed videos of children going to school wearing plastic visors, like you wear if you're using a chainsaw, and masks. Social distancing, two meters apart, walking in single file line and lockstep, to go take it to the face. The lies that their government's going to tell them about reality, their place in reality, their history, their anthropology, where they come from, and where they're going. This is what we get. We get more social distancing. We get rolling lockdowns throughout the year whenever we want. Whenever, to, not we want. <laughs> we don't get anything we want. We get whatever they want if we accept this. We're told this is the new normal and this is what we get. So if we acquiesce to this, if we be obedient little global citizens, we get more of this terror. We get the normalization of hypochondria, right? the suppression of our immune system because we're locked inside in cages. And we get more of this. And they tell you, oh, well, if you don't accept this, you're going to die. Right? We're, we're all going to die. We're going to, we're, you're all going to die if you don't accept this. Or your loved ones are going to die if you don't accept this. And that's your fault. Our loved ones and us, we're all going to die anyways, aren't we? <laughs> we're all going to die regardless. But we're told that if we accept this new normal, we can live like this until we die. <laughs> Isn't that nice? That our kids can live like this until they die. Right, you got Cuomo today saying that school, we can't ever have school go back to normal. Where'd that go? New York and Gates Foundation to develop blueprint. Reimagine education amid pandemic. I'm sorry, guys, I keep. Reimagine education amid pandemic. Let me make this a little smaller so everybody can see it. Let's take, this, let's take this experience and learn what we can do differently and better with our education system in terms of technology and virtual education. And he says, I don't see any reason why kids should ever go back to school. <laughs> they should be doing their school at home and the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation should be telling them what is reality and helping to reformat the education system. This is what we're being told. That this is going to be the new normal. And if we accept this, this is what we get. If we don't accept this, what do we get? We're still going to die. <laughs> but maybe, just maybe, we'll be able to not live in this oppressive, nonsensical, hypochondriac, schizophrenic hellhole that's being built around us. Maybe we can still go to restaurants if we don't submit. We'll still pay taxes, I'm sure. <laughs> so that that tax money can be used to um, uh, to extract resources from third world developing nations to bomb nations all over the planet we'll still do that stuff but maybe we'll be able to go outside and get vitamin d maybe we'll be able to decide what foods we can buy yeah if we don't accept this we will still die if we do accept this we will die but what happens in between now and the time we will inevitably die which we all will, that's up to us. That's up to us. All right, we got some super chats here. Tommy, Tommy Kelly, we already read that one. Says, starting off with the non-essentials. Thanks, dude. Started a little cascade there. Jacob Bradford, what's up, man? Says, five bucks. Can you explain the dangers of developing a, a shot for coronavirus? Why do we see people like Bill Gates pushing for this? What's the motive? I mean, there are many motives. Many motives behind these things. Um, I mean, what are the dangers? Fauci has even told us about the dangers. And if people are immune compromised, they can be given conditions and illnesses from these jabs. If people are already immune compromised, they're going to be much more susceptible to an aberrant immune response to these things. And who knows what other adjuvants and things are being put into these products. Right? There are many dangers, many, many different things. They're talking about RNA modification, Right. essentially modifying our genes and our RNA, right? This is, this is very, very potentially um, uh, uh, dangerous. And I think, um, I think there's a lot of interesting information, a lot of good information out there if you want to dig deeper. I mean, you could just start by reading the inserts. You can just start by looking at the history of the stuff that's already out there H for HPV and measles and whatnot. 
Uh, there's a lot of information out there already. So thank you for the super chat, Jacob. Appreciate that. Chris Casanova, four ninety nine. What's good with the next Keto Collective? We miss you on Boiler Room, bro. What's up, Chris? Um, you know, we ha we've been doing, we do weekly coaching calls in our private members forum and our inner circle private forum. So we haven't been doing the group coaching. What I've been doing is actually, there you go. Check out Jay Dyer's, just uh, Jay Dyer's old video on Jonas Salk. Watch that video. Right, I mean, read Bertrand Russell, The Scientific Outlook and the Impact of Science on Society, where he says we'll use diet injections and injunctions to mold and form the sort of character that the elite and governments want. Paraphrasing, but almost quoting <laughs> directly right there. I mean, you can yeah, definitely check out Jay's uh, work on Jonas Salk. But um, yeah, come back. All right, so Chris Casanova, back to the question at hand. Keto and Carnivore Collective, that is our group coaching. We haven't been doing the group coaching. What we've been doing is building up our private inner circle members forum where we do weekly coaching calls. So get in on that. It's actually, it's a more affordable way of getting coaching. And I still do private coaching. If you do private coaching, you get two months in the Inner Circle Members Forum where we do weekly coaching calls. We've got a nice group of like-minded people who are there to support you and help you out. So we got Mia O sending 999. Thanks, Mia O. Sending this non-essential person. <laughs> sending, she must be an essential. She must be an essential. So she sent 999. says, just accept the hashtag new normal and get yourself a smart city apartment, bro. A smart city coffin apartment, bro. There we go. We just, we just have to eat the vegan kibble, eat the plant-based fake plastic cheese in our smart city coffin apartments, snitch on our neighbors, and take it to the face from the Bill Gates and Melinda, Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation and educate our children from their computers at home, and we will all get through this, guys. And if we don't do that, we're all going to die. But if you do that, do that we're all going to die, and we're going to live miserably until then. And that's our choice. What are we going to do? Are we going to accept this? Are we going to continue to be muzzled? Are we going to be dehumanized? Or are we going to stand up? Are we going to open our businesses and live our lives? This is our choice. This is our choice. All right, Tyler Sutton too. What's up, dude? Just paying it forward, bro. FYI, going to build a suburban chicken coop. I will take any advice from the audience. Right on, suburban chicken coop. Easy to do, man. I mean, you can use recycled materials. A little bit of chicken wire. Chicken wire is going to be the most expensive part. All right, get cheap recycled wood. Use some chicken wire. If you actually, uh, the best resource I would say for starting to you know, work with chickens and whatnot and do some home stuff or even like scaling it bigger, check out Justin Rhodes on YouTube. He does a really good job. All right, so the Rockefeller Foundation, WHO, Bill Gates, these are the good grown ups. They know what's best for us. And they've been plotting these things out for a very long time and gaming this stuff. We've got, where'd it go? The Rockefeller Foundation, major investors in big pharma, tech, biotech, obsessed with overpopulation, helped to bring about National Security Study Memorandum 200, which was also called the Kissinger Memo, where it talked about the biggest national security priority for the State Department, for the United States military, should be the depopulation of the so-called developing world so that the resources could be extracted. They have published a plan to test all Americans weekly with the National Guard, to track and trace everybody, and then export this to the world. If you check out my Twitter, we've got a link to the Rockefeller Foundation National COVID-19 Testing Action Plan, Pragmatic Steps to Reopen Our Workplaces and Our Communities. This is the document right here. Testing everybody weekly. Every single American weekly, they're saying, should be tested. And then they want to export this to the rest of the world. And then the philanthropists, of course, will help give loans <laughs> through the, uh, the IMF so that these countries can pay back the good grown-ups at the international pharma pharmaceutical and agricultural cartels like Bayer Monsanto, like Merck, GlaxoSmithKline so that they can pay them back for all this philanthropy that they're going to do. And guess what? This also involves what's called a community health care core for testing and contact tracing. So this document was released. Let's see, it was at least a week before that tweet. This is like two weeks ago or so that this was released. You can find the actual the full report on my Twitter. 
to talk about creating a data commons and digital platform for consolidating all the data and creating contact tracing cores. Now, contact tracing is essentially just military Stasi-style surveillance rebranded. That's what this is. Contact tracing is a snitch society like you had in the Soviet Union rebranded and is one of the first steps and a huge step towards what had been planned by the World Economic Forum, by these big foundations for so long, the stuff that Jay and I have been talking about on these streams for so long, the stuff that Jay's been talking about in his uh, Globalist book series for so long. Oh, by the way, Jay Dyer. Jay Dyer sent a, a super chat, says 10 bucks, says thanks, bro. Thank you, Jay. Appreciate that, man. Guys, check out Jay's channel because he's been getting into this stuff for a long time. Right, documenting this in a very scholarly way, but having some fun with it too, just like we do on these streams. This contact tracing is about surveillance and bringing in social credits, the social credit system, which is going to integrate the carbon taxing schemes that have been talked about for so long. Now check it out. We've got 700,000 infections, they say, 35,000 deaths, 21 million people lost their job, but don't worry They've got a plan to scale up testing of everybody always and have contact tracing core armies that are out there testing people. And the Rockefeller Foundation says that we should use the National Guard to implement this as well. And we should use state resources at the state level and the federal level to use this as well in what are called public-private partnerships. Now, public-private partnerships are what used to be called fascism and communism a few decades ago. But of course, just like contact tracing, these things are rebranded, all right? Military surveillance is contact tracing. Communism and fascism are now called <laughs> public-private partnerships, right? Now, when the government took over the corporations, that used to be called communism. When the corporations took over the government and ran the government, that used to be called fascism. Of course, they're kind of two sides of the same coin, and they both bring about the same thing. All right, Bertrand Russell wrote about this. Huxley wrote about this. They bring about what's called, by a lot of these people, the final revolution, the post-human era. So they're talking about bringing in a community health care core of hundreds of thousands of people. And this isn't just some, like, kooky idea. This isn't just some, like, crazy kooky thing here. This is actually being implemented immediately. Got the Washington Post. We can scale up testing. We're just waiting on the government to agree. So the COVID-19 testing regimen for President Trump and his staff, some of whom are tested even more frequently. So again, we should be testing frequently, always testing, always getting DNA samples and whatnot. If we submit, if we allow this to be told, if we allow this narrative to be assumed to be true, that we need to do this, that this is the only way to move forward, this is what we get, constant testing, public-private partnerships running your life and telling you if you can go outside, if you can have a job, deciding who's essential, who's non-essential workers, aka cutting you off from your supply of food and the ability to move around, the ability to make an income in this basically eugenic-style testing that they want to roll out to everybody. So here they mention the Rockefeller Foundation, a bipartisan team of experts. Experts, guys, they're experts. Do you hate science? Do you hate the children and grandma? Do you hate progress? Then why are you not listening to the experts? The experts, bipartisan too, look, bipartisan. They're bipartisan. Experts convened by the Rockefeller Foundation, of which I am a member, says this uh, Washington Post. Washington Post owned by Jeff Bezos, who's made, what, $48 billion since this started? Drew up plans for scaling up testing from 1 million to 30 million weekly. 30 million weekly. And they link to the same, to the same report. So this is being rolled out. And now we've got, where'd he go? Where's our boy? Where's our boy, Gavin? We've got, here we go. Here's a post, this <laughs> is from Jay's, from Jay's uh, Instagram. 
Maybe if I say I'm gonna stay home forever, I will never die. Here we go. Here's Gavin Newsom talking to another philanthropist, selfless philanthropist, one of the good grown-ups, um, who just wants to help you. Bill Clinton, everybody. Bill Clinton is here to help. And guess what? The Clinton Global Initiative, a totally legitimate philanthropic endeavor, much like the Rockefeller Foundation, the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundations. And when I say this, I'm obviously being facetious. I mean, these foundations were brought about to rebrand the robber barons as philanthropists. So just like you rebrand military surveillance and social credits as contact tracing, you rebrand... Um, oh, what else did we talk about rebranding? You rebrand uh, uh, communism and fascism as public-private partnerships. We get to rebrand... <laughs> We get to rebrand ourselves. Right? When you become a, a bloodthirsty billionaire, notoriously corrupt billionaire, like Rockefeller was, right? People, I mean, there, there were massacres of workers done by Standard Oil, right? People were being slaughtered by these robber barons. People were being, their lives were being destroyed by these robber barons who consolidated the entire U.S. economy about 100 years ago. And then rebranded themselves, a bit over 100 years ago, rebranded themselves as philanthropists. So then you have the Ford Foundation, the Rockefeller Foundation, the MacArthur Foundation, the Wellcome Trust, which is a British pharmaceutical cartel's rebranding of their agenda as philanthropy, right? Now we've got uh, the Clinton Global Initiative with Gavin Newsom. Let's hear what they've got to say. But one of the things that you have to be able to do is to track people who are positive. Where were they? Who were they in contact with? How can you hem up any recurrence of this? Uh, should we have, like, should, like you did with the, California did with the Conservation Corps of Young People, should we have a contract tracer corps, even if we call it something more elegant? Should we... Yeah really build the first public health network we've ever really built in this country over on this issue? The predicate for getting back to some semblance of normalcy is our ability to... Oops. It's coming. Identify individuals through testing to be able to trace their contacts to isolate individuals uh, that have uh, either uh, been exposed or quarantined people that are tested positive. And that's just going to require an army of folks and the capacity of consideration from individuals to allow uh, for their privacy uh, to be impacted by that kind of acuity of attention based upon where they've been and who they've talked to. This virtual group of contact tracers um, would contact anybody who's tested positive to learn about their recent activities, um, who they may have been in contact with. We had something like 7,000 people, 9,000 people apply within the first couple of days to be contact tracers so that we can actually use people who are out of place, um, out of work rather, um, who can be trained, even lay people. There you go. So people who are out of work, who were forced out of work because their businesses were closed, can now become snitches and get riches for being snitches to help the Rockefeller Foundation, the eugenics-obsessed organization, also obsessed with depopulation, to help them to collect DNA samples and to socially engineer your behavior and to lock you up if needed and to contact trace you to see who you're in contact with, right? So I don't know if this stuff sounds familiar, but a lot of this comes straight out of the pre-crime stuff that has been implemented or been um, uh, developed over the last few decades. And the stuff that the, uh, the, the programs that they were going to try to use to stop uh, mass, called mass casualty events, right? Where somebody goes out and hurts a bunch of people with a weapon. This is the same thing, the same system is now being rolled out to track your health, 
citizen health brigades. And we all know that these corporations like, you know, and big pharma, they're so good at, at helping us to be healthy, right? You know, I mean, the recommendations that are given by the WHO to eat more seed oils, to stop eating your animal foods, the animal foods that actually help you to be healthy, we're told that they're bad, that we should avoid them. And instead, we should have seed oils right? and mass-produced kibble. All these corporations, pharmaceutical companies, these big oil companies as well, are also members of the World Business Council for Sustainable Development, pushing for planetary dietary guidelines, for carbon taxation, and for a new economic model that nobody wanted to accept. But now, now that we've got this crisis and a mandatory shutdown of everything, now they're talking about rolling it out. All right, this new economic model based on social credits. All right, we got some we got some super chats over here. Let me jump over here. Um, thanks everybody for supporting. By the way, I always love I get to see some of my favorite channels in here supporting. Sometimes got Jay Dyer, got some of our our regular viewers like Tyler Sutton, and we've got Laura Painter. Laura, thank you so much for the support. She said fourteen ninety nine ninety nine. She didn't even say anything. Laura, um, appreciate that. Make sure make sure to watch your neighbors. Keep an eye out if they if you hear your neighbors coughing. Please call Bill Clinton. Especially if she's a lady. All right, we got Aaron, the big black dude. What's up, dude? Send 10 bucks. Says, uh, you've talked about all this for years. It's crazy that this is actually happening in our lifetime so fast. I hope everyone is staying fit. Yeah, guys. Right? We, if we submit to this, if we just bow down in fear, if we just lay down in a puddle of our own piss in our homes, there's going to be more to come. If people stand up and speak up against this, if people actually take action, if people actually take action to make themselves healthy, to build up resilience in their food supply and the food distribution networks in their, in their local area, resilience in their immune systems, resilience in their families, and teach their kids properly how to say no, then we won't have to live in this nonsensical dystopia that these people are trying to bring about, that they're telling us is inevitable and this is a new... Uh, the new normal and all that. We do not have to accept this. So Aaron, I always appreciate your input, dude. Thanks for the support. Right, so the Rockefeller Foundation, unchanged since 1913 in their mission. What was their mission? To obscure and hide and play shell games with the monopolistic power that was derived from the complete takeover of the U.S. financial and economic system that these robber barons implemented. So the Rockefeller Foundation, they just want to save the world. Google and Gates Foundation join forces to promote digital payments. The digital currency, especially for the third world, is another foot in the door towards the social credit system that they've been talking about implementing. Digital financial services to the world's 1.7 billion unbanked people. All oh, those poor unbanked masses. The unwashed unbanked masses. We got to get them banked. Right, and this ties in with our food system as well. David Rockefeller's Center for Latin American Studies at Harvard University promoting the spread of GMOs promoting big ag practices, promoting the neoliberal model, and the seeds of destruction. Now, I've been talking about this book for a while. This is a really good book. Uh, breaks down the history of the implementation, uh, or the, uh, the, the rollout, basically, and the consolidation of our agricultural system under this industrial agriculture model that disempowers rural people, that destroys their ability to feed themselves on their own land, and makes you dependent on all this mass-produced GMO plant-based kibble. This is a very good book. Check it out. It's by F. William Engdahl. Seeds of Destruction, The Hidden Agenda of Genetic Manipulation. And this is a really good introduction for, I mean, even, uh, even normies who don't really know much about how this stuff works. So we've got the Rockefeller Foundation was engaged in bringing this about from the beginning, uh, bringing about this plant-based meat revolution now. We've got Bill Gates, biggest, one of the biggest investors in Beyond Meat. Bill Gates, he's bullish on plant-based fake meat 
and on lab-grown meat. Whoa, what a surprise. Lab-grown meat, too. And that's what's coming down the pipe. So we've got Frederick Leroy. This guy's pretty cool. He's, uh, you know, I've, I've shared some resources with him over the years, and it's cool seeing him talk about this stuff and seeing him put the pieces together with uh, groups like the Club of Rome. Um, I remember sending him Stanford Research Institute's The Changing Images of Man. And now he puts this in some of his graphics. He's an academic. But, you know, Frederick, why aren't you coming on my show, dude? I've been trying to get you on the show for a while to talk about this stuff, but he didn't want to come on my show. He wants to lay low on that. But I think I, th I appreciate you using the resources that I've been sending you. I wish you'd give me a shout out every once in a while, but it's all good. So he's here talking about China processing up to 79% of the soy protein isolate, 50% of the textured soy protein, 23% of the soy protein concentrate used worldwide. All right, so you've got the Good Food Institute promoting planetary dietary guidelines. You have the Wellcome Trust funding the Eat Lancet Committee which the World Business Council for Sustainable Development also is involved in. Those companies that are on that include Google, Unilever, Monsanto, Cargill, all the big grain conglomerates, uh, even Michelin, BP, Shell, all members of the World Business Council for Sustainable Development. Because right? Monsanto and Bayer are just some of the most sustain sustainable companies in the world. So they're pushing now soy protein, plant-based protein, as our meat supply shorting out and that's what we're going to talk about more in about 30 minutes we're going to have a special guest on from RCAF we've got Bill Bullard from RCAF is going to jump on and we're going to talk about the real issues behind the meat supply and what's really going on there with meat prices and how what we see now is not a surprise to a lot of guys like Bill so let's hear what Shad Sullivan he's the regional director of RCAF UNA a regional director of RCAF UNA uh, sorry USA Let's hear what he has to say about food shortages and what is going on. Matt Sullivan coming to you from the head. Oops. Come on now. From the headwaters of Bitter Creek, Archer County, North Texas, we have to talk. State officials will be assisting to help identify potential alternative markets if a producer is unable to move animals and if necessary, advise and assist on depopulation and disposal methods. Ladies and gentlemen, we are plowing under vegetable crops from coast to coast. We are euthanizing millions of chickens. We are aborting sows and burying feeder pigs. We are dumping milk by the hundreds of thousands of gallons, and now they are preparing us to depopulate the fat cattle ready to harvest because of a bottleneck created by the effects of COVID. This thing hasn't been created by COVID, but the effects of COVID and the logistics therein. We are in trouble. Our Food supply is in trouble, and I am appealing to producers and consumers across the nation to start calling. Yesterday, the first shipment of imported beef from the country of Namibia hit the shores of the United States of America. And yet this morning, they are telling us to prepare to euthanize Harvest ready cattle. Am I the only one that sees a problem in this? It is time we get the American people back to work. It is time we get money flowing. It is time we get food on the shelves. All right, so what the hell is going on here? Why would governments be telling people to cull their herds, to depopulate their livestock while importing beef? from Namibia, from Brazil, from Australia heavily the last few years, to undercut American producers. Why would this be going on? We're gonna talk about this in the second hour, but this is what is happening. And we're talking about it right now. We're gonna get deeper into this in the second hour with a guest from RCAF, Bill Bullard, who I really appreciate uh, that he's taking the time out of his day to come on and speak with us. Let me make sure he's not in there already. 
All right, yeah, Bill will be coming on in about 35 minutes. So why is this happening? We've got Costco, ShopRite, Wegmans, Whole Foods. Limit meat purchases to avoid food supply chain problems. Food supply chain problems that we've talked about are engineered. You've got four major corporations who own the entire meat packing and processing industry, and this is fortified by USDA and government subsidies that allow this, that promote this. What is going on here? Why? Why is this happening? Well, as we've been talking about for a long time, it's very easy to create meat shortages when you have a bottleneck, a small bottleneck on the processing facilities. This makes it very difficult for local producers to slaughter their own animals, process that carcass, and butcher and send it out across state lines. You have to go to the USDA facilities to send your stuff across state lines. We talked about this with Garland Farms last time he came on. I thought I had a Garland Farms post pulled up here, but I don't see it. Um, ah, here it is. Here we go. Garland Farms, who I reposted his... I reposted on my uh, community page, one of his community posts. He says, even though mandatory country of origin labeling is preferred by 93% of the U.S. population, I guess that's according to some polls, the NCBA, which is the National Cattlemen's Beef Association, this is a group that all these cattle farmers, when they sell an animal to be processed, to be slaughtered, they pay taxes, basically, to this group that is run by, that is actually run by, I think it was the, the president or the CEO, I'm not sure what, is, what he's called, it was a former Cargill executive. <laughs> so if you check out Garland Farms' um, YouTube ch uh, channel and his community page, he's been documenting a lot of this stuff there. Um, so you've got former Cargill employee running the NCBA, and Cargill being the one of the biggest um, uh, slaughterhouse owners, uh, one of the biggest producers of grain, also also heavily invested and heavily promoting plant-based alternatives to beef while undercutting the farmers here. Do you see what's going on here? The same big economic... And this is what I've been saying from the freaking beginning. This is what I've been telling these vegan activists for so long, that the very corporations that are bankrolling their vegan propaganda, that are pushing their plant-based dietary guidelines for the planet, that are basically bankrolling the vegan activism movement and allowing them to be popularized and allowing their message to be normalized, the same corporations that are funding this and the big economic interests and the World Economic Forum and the member corporations of the World Business Council for Sustainable Development, these same corporations run the factory farm, so-called factory farming industry, the industrial agriculture industry, and they don't care whether it's plant-based or animal-based. In fact, they prefer to sell you the plant-based kibble. You know why? Because it makes them more rich because it's cheaper to produce, and because it cuts out those pesky little middlemen who always historically have made things so hard for tyrants to control the rural people who actually produce food, the people who are demonized on television and media and by the vegan activists who try to make people who produce their own food, people who are farming, they try to make us out as Cousin, uh, cousin Mary and Hicks who are ignorant and stupid and who are just too dumb to work in an office or a desk job or to be a contact tracer or an essential twerker. They make us out to be idiots. Why is that? So they made it illegal to have country of origin labeling in the U.S. How crazy is that? So Garland Forum says a questionable USDA granted them their wish and now Americans can't tell the difference between American beef and Brazilian beef or Namibian beef at grocery stores. The graph below shows how abolishing country of origin labeling led to unprecedented losses for American beef producers while retailers are charging record prices. This is why beef is more expensive, but the farmers in the U.S. get less, the ranchers get less for their animals. This is why. Because middlemen are fleecing you. Middlemen are fleecing you and the plant-based... <laughs> the plant-based movement... 
is here to feed you the kibble instead. While beef is unnecessarily hiked up in price, right? It shouldn't, the price shouldn't be that high for the consumer, I, in my opinion. The farmers, the ranchers should be getting more per pound from their animals. And the middlemen should be cut out altogether. But you've got middlemen who want to buy from these producers whom they despise. Even your little boy, broke, dark, and handsome here, that's his whole gig. To sell you middleman meat from who knows where at a premium price and rip the farmers off. So the ranchers are getting screwed, the consumers getting screwed, but these people are stoked because they get to get in between you and your food supply. So when you're supporting plant-based meat alternatives, like the Beyond Burger that Bill Gates made, when you're listening to Dr. Greger and you're eating a so-called whole food plant-based diet, which nobody does, they're all eating the fake meat substitutes, they're all eating the vegan junk food. When you listen to these people or when you buy, when you buy middleman beef from Broke, Dark, and Handsome, when you buy middleman meat, you're not supporting these producers and you're actually screwing yourself long term. These grocery stores are making a killing right now. All right, so the country of origin stuff, that's a big deal. U.S. faces, faces meat shortage while its pork exports to China soar. You've got a meat shortage, but exports to China. China. Exports to China. It's, it's soaring. Why is this? What is going on here? What is going on here? Meat packers and livestock producers in the U.S. have spent it the la at least a year adjusting to the surge in business to China, which has faced a severe pork shortage in the wake of its battle against African swine fever. Which, that's a whole other rabbit hole. Right, so that we've got possible biological warfare happening against your livestock in the future. People have talked about this as a potential threat. People like Bill Gates have talked about this stuff, but we're not even going to get into that today. Gene, uh, what it's called, gene drive technology, stuff like that, <laughs> that Bill and Linda Gates Foundation have funded. But we've got a major pork shortage in China where they've culled most of their herds, where now it's being, they're, uh, they're talking about banning the wet markets, which are getting blamed for the current outbreak but have never been proven. And actually, it seems like most people don't believe it originated there. <laughs> um, they're trying to ban these wet markets. And of course, and the vegan demons on YouTube are saying, this is great, we've got to ban it, ban it all. We have to ban this in China. Right? This globalist rhetoric, we have to save the world. We're sending pork and beef from the US to China. Well, Americans are paying record highs while ranchers are being told to kill their animals and they can't get them to the market. They can't get them to the market. They can't get them to the end consumer because of the bottleneck that was created by the very corporations that are making the plant-based meat alternatives. And you've got the World Economic Forum talking about rethinking the way we eat meat. Ooh, look at this plant-based hamburger. Look at this impossible burger. So they've been talking about this for years. World Economic Forum, plant-based meat alternatives could save lives. Oh! It's going to save lives. They released a new report saying the meat alternatives are going to save lives. The future series alternative protein. All right. This is the agenda. It's to sell you plant-based junk. How big food is responding to the alternative protein boom. What this should be titled is how big food, the World Economic Forum, and the big global economic interests have created the protein boom, the so-called alternative protein boom. They've created this, and this is about cutting off your ability to feed yourselves, demonizing your livestock, telling you it's destroying the planet, your babies are destroying the planet, your livestock's destroying the planet, you're dirty, stay inside. This is what they're telling you. Plant-based milk alternatives, which are basically just water with blended up indigestible plant trash in them, colored white. <laughs> that's what it is water with blended plants in it they tell you that's going to replace milk 
which you can produce in your own land, right? We've got, where'd it go? Did I close it? You know, here's, here's an animal right here. This bioconverter. This bioconverter creates plant-based milk. Plant-based milk right here on our own land. Plant-based milk right here for us. This morning we got, I think it was like eight, maybe eight and a half liters of plant-based milk just made from grass and shrubs from our yard. From uh, grass and shrubs from our own land with no external inputs. Oh, should we give them some mineral salt. And we give them some, uh, some molasses now. And I freaking love molasses. And this makes us milk every day. But that's actually, that's all I've had today. It was just, it's just a little bit of my, my plant-based milk here. So everything I've put in my body today has come from right here. No machines necessary, no mined minerals, none of that. No processing facilities, no processing at all. But we're told that's bad, that's destroying the planet. And the corporations that have consolidated the dairy industry, the beef industry, don't care about local producers and want to cut you out. It's about vertical integration, vertically integrating the whole food chain. Beyond Meat plans U.S. discounts, hopes to replace beef on summer grills. So Beyond Meat, which is massively overpriced already, while they're making, while its big investors like Bill Gates are making beef more expensive through engineering food shortages, while that is happening, they're going to sell you the alternative, which is terribly, terrible nutritionally, right? which is more destructive environmentally, they're going to sell you that instead. Tyson expects to keep slowing meat production as coronavirus sickens workers and tanks income. So Tyson is also getting involved in the plant-based alternatives as well. Costco, don't worry though. When you go to Costco and they limit your meat purchases, when you could just go directly to a farmer and buy it directly from them, but when you could just go, you can just go buy your own animal and there's nobody stopping you from slaughtering it at your home. Right, from slaughtering an animal in your own yard. Derek Nance has been talking about this for a long time. He's been getting sheep and slaughtering them at home. There's nothing to stop you from doing this and having an ample supply of very, very affordable, good quality grass-fed beef at home. You can even get a quarter of a cow or buy a half a cow from a local producer. You usually pay like a month or so ahead of time. And you can have that at your own home. So there are solutions here, which is local production, which is removing the middlemen, and getting out of that thin bottleneck that allows this to be choked off at any time. That bottleneck can just be closed up at any time now. We're being, it's being normalized that they can just shut it all down whenever they want. Oh look, a few people got sick. Let's shut it down. You don't have to accept this though. Then you gotta go to Costco to get your, your meat rations, and then, but they're gonna let the, uh, the essential twerkers not wait in line. You gotta wait in line outside with a muzzle, standing six feet away from each other, in lockstep, but the essential twerkers, are, are, they, are they considering Walmart employees essential twerkers too? Because we know that Walmarts are essential, right? But churches are not essential. Churches closed, Walmart open. Woo! <laughs> this pisses me off. And, but th these guys, they get to go to the front of the line. These people get to go to the front of the line. Look how, look at the war zone. Look how hard it is for them. Look how difficult, look at this. It's a battle zone. These are the real heroes. These are the heroes and they're gonna save us with the standard of care that is basically butchery. They gotta go to the front of the line. All right, I'm coming back now. Here we go. <sighs> coming back. Oh, we lost half the viewers. There you go. That's how it goes. It is what it is. But now we're back. We had the essential workers. They get to go to the front of the line. Costco, limiting purchases, rationing meat. But you don't have to go to Costco. We don't have to support Costco. We can buy locally produced food from local producers, from directly from the ranchers. 
And that's what we should be doing. We should be supporting local production and even moving towards producing food ourselves. Producing it ourselves. What a novel concept, doing exactly what we've been doing for thousands of years. But it's been demonized now, and we're told that that's just what you know ignorant hicks do. All right, now we're going to see more and more intelligent people leaving the big cities, leaving the big cities and moving into the countryside and producing their own food. Guys, make sure to like this and share it. Where are them super chats at too, guys? We need your support here. These all get demonetized. These all get hidden in the algorithm. We need your support. So thank you guys for the ones who have donated generously via those super chats. We much appreciate it. We're just trying to stay afloat here, guys. We're locked down here as well. We got this same nonsense everywhere being pushed on us here. On all us ignorant hicks up in the middle of nowhere in Ecuador. We're on lockdown too, even though nobody's even sick. Nobody's even sick in this town that we live in. All right, so we get told that our food sources are bad, they're destroying the planet, that we're so dirty, that we just have to eat the kibble. And we got these vegan activists talking about we got to ban meat. Meat is not essential. So we've got Ryan from Happy Healthy Vegan. What's up, Ryan? Oh, we've got a super chat. A happy, healthy super chat from location 515. Uh, I got to hear Ryan's voice again before I can properly do a <laughs> Ryan from Happy Healthy Vegan. Who banned me from his live stream and from his channel from simply asking a question. I've been trying to get this dude to come on for a debate for a long time now. None of these guys will. None of these dudes will. Isn't that funny? Joey Carbstrong, Earthling Ed, Ryan from Happy Healthy Vegan. None of them wanted to debate. Location 515 sent 20 bucks, says ignorant hick. You know what? I'll take that abuse for those 20 non-essential dollars of yours, dude. You must be an essential because I'm just an ignorant hick non-essential over here. Helen Guilford sent in 999. Thank you, Helen. Appreciate that. Location 515, you're right. Ryan is trying to run for city council in Malibu. He's going to be a city council member in Malibu, right? So it's like you got all these yuppies in Malibu who are just like, we should go vegan. If we just all go vegan, then like everything will be okay, dude. If we all go vegan and live in Malibu, right? Like we've got to take care of the horses of Malibu and stop exploiting them, bro. We've got to all go vegan. We could be happy and healthy. Let's see what he's got to say. Happy Healthy Vegan, and this has been an oh, sorry, we need that full intro. Hey, this is Ryan of Happy Healthy Vegan, and this has been an ongoing story. Hopefully, you saw my first video back in mid-April, where I showed how a large pork slaughterhouse facility in South Dakota was forced to close because too many of its workers were coming down with COVID-19. Well, Smithfield Food, a giant in food processing and processing animals, was forced to close down a pig slaughterhouse after nearly 300 of its 730 employees tested positive for COVID-19. And the closure of just... <laughs> yeah. All right. OK is pointing out. <laughs> Notice this, too. Look at the painting. Look at the painting on the back of his wall. He's got his chick, his wife, dressed up like a dominatrix, spreading her legs <laughs> on the wall. <laughs> Happy, healthy, vegan, bringing you the happy, healthy pornography on my wall. Check out my lava lamp, dude. I'm totally alt. I'm like really alternative, bro. Like, I totally have like two Pixies albums on vinyl, dude. I'm super alt, bro. Look at my guitar. Look at my guitar. I move my bong away from my lava lamp. Because I don't want you to see my bong in the video. But I'm Ryan, bro. We all gotta go vegan. Check out my lava lamp. I'm totally like 60s, like hippie style, bro. I'm an alternative. Just this one pig slaughterhouse should have ripples throughout the whole food supply chain because this one slaughterhouse supplies about 5% of our nation's pork. 
And since making that video two weeks ago, the spread of COVID-19 amongst workers in slaughterhouses and meat processing plants has gotten even worse. Almost 900 workers at a Tyson Foods plant in Indiana have tested positive for coronavirus. That's about 40% of its workforce. So not surprised. 40% of 40% of its workforce tested positive for coronavirus. Uh, they, they tested some goats and and also tested like a papaya in Madagascar and they're also positive. So we've got like Bill Gates is gonna try to find like a good vaccine that we can give all the papayas and then the papayas can get back to their essential twerking, bro. 40% <laughs> of people are testing positive. They sent tests to some of these other countries, it was in Madagascar, they tested a goat. I'm not joking, a goat and a papaya tested positive. The tests are freaking false. The tests here, everybody knows that they're bullshit. I was talking to a friend the other day, and we were talking about a dude who works in a hospital. He's an, it was an EMR, not EMR, he's a, uh, is that what it's called, an EMT? EMT. Works in a hospital, works in the ER. <laughs> And they know at the hospitals that the tests are like 50% effective. It's like, why don't we just get, let's give people a coin and they flip the coin. And if it's heads, they got it. If it's tails, they don't got it. Right. This Tyson plant. Tanzania. That's, there you go. Tanzania, papaya, goat, and quail tested positive. Along with oh. several other Tyson plants, along with many other slaughterhouses around the country who are experiencing similar problems with COVID-19 amongst their workers they have decided to close down operations. Slaughterhouses have shut down. Unfortunately, President Trump signed an emergency order. Oh, Orange Man bad, dude. Unfortunately, Orange Man signed an order saying that we need meat or whatever, dude. <laughs> Unfortunately, big bigot racist Trump. This is so funny, man. Look, isn't it funny like all these... All these like LA wannabe socialists, they've got Trump doing exactly what they wanted. They've got Trump giving universal basic income, shutting down the whole economy. Orange Man's doing exactly what all these people who act like they hate Orange Man wanted Orange Man to do. But it's still Orange Man bad, even though Orange Man is bringing in a <laughs> communist dictatorship to the US. He's so bad still. Demanding uh. slaughterhouses and meat processing facilities to remain open despite these widespread outbreaks of coronavirus amongst their workers. And this is despite the fact that approximately 5,000 meat industry workers have contracted COVID-19 and 20 have died. This is an absolute nightmare situation for people who work in the meat production businesses. I mean, first of all, they're some of the most exploited workers in any industry out there. It, reports have shown that these workers are discouraged from calling in sick. They don't get any kind of paid leave. In fact, they even need to report to work when displaying symptoms of illness, else they risk losing their job. Once they're there working ill, it's virtually impossible amongst workers on the production lines there to maintain any type of social distancing of six feet. They work essentially shoulder to shoulder. So unfortunately, more and more of these meat processing workers will continue to contract coronavirus as they continue working in these conditions. These conditions which have led to where they're at right now, with some plants having as much as 50% of their workforce infected. And it doesn't stop at the factory. These factory workers leave, they go home, and can spread it amongst people they live with, family members, older family members. Oh, just all I, care, I just care about these workers, dude. I just care about the twerkers. Meat is non-essential. So he, he's white knighting for the workers, right? All these, all these poor exploited workers. White knighting for the workers, yet this is what he eats. Dole and Chiquita bananas imported from places like Ecuador. Where people live right next to, this is what banana, these are the banana fields in Ecuador. This used to be forest and jungle. And this is where the people live who produce his bananas. See those little shacks? That's where the debt slaves that produce his bananas work. And he's over here talking about the poor exploited workers in the meat processing facilities. That's where they live. And there's where, the, as far as the eye can see, 
got a few trees in there in between them. They got some avocado trees and whatnot. And then they've got just miles and miles of banana fields. Well, here's what they do. Here's what bananas. Here's how they uh, fumigate these bananas. So they're, they're driving over with a, you're flying over with an airplane. If you're listening to this later on on alternate current radio on our podcast, there's an airplane flying over these banana fields, fumigating it, spraying pesticides all over it. Look at that. Oh, it's giving super special medicine. The bananas have to be covered in plastic. See how they're covered in plastic? They're covered in plastic bags. Those plastic bags are there because they're being fumigated with carcinogens. And they're there to protect them from birds who will still eat them even though they're fumigated with carcinogens and those birds will die. Then they get dipped in chemicals after they're harvested. Right? This, but he's over here white knighting for the... Uh, look at that. As far as the eye can see, bananas in Ecuador. This is where your bananas come from, Ryan. Getting fumigated. Look at that. Look at that house right there. In the middle of that. That might just be a little bodega. But people's homes live... People live in little homes. There's a road right there. People are driving on these roads. People are getting fumigated here too. But Ryan's going to save the world because meat's so mean. And it's not necessary. And these workers also will spread it amongst the community that they live in. So essentially our... Pre oh, and, and the social distancing thing, right? So there's, there's more of this, the social distancing. We always have to social distance now. Nobody's allowed to be around each other anymore, right? There have been thousands of outbreaks of uh, flus and colds. There have been thousands of different coronaviruses over the years. There have been plagues. There have been uh, uh, pestilences that have destroyed populations many times. But now, this one is just so special. This one that has a 90, more than a 99.7% survival rate. <laughs> more than a 99.7% survival rate. We have to social distance forever now. We can't ever protest again. We gotta all stay six feet or more away from each other. So we've gotta decrease the production capacity of everything. It ties right in with the sustainable development goals, right? So we're gonna have to run these meat factories at what, like 15%, 20%? So then that's going to make the price of food go up for no reason at all because you got to be six feet away from each other. The president has proclaimed that those who work in slaughterhouses to be essential workers because our president fears that there will be meat shortages that people in our country will face, which would cause society to collapse. First of all, I want to point out that this executive order does nothing to prevent the continued shipments of meat produced in the United States overseas to China. Exactly. Or to stop meat produced from overseas to come into the United States and undercut producers. So he, Ryan's stoned ass made one half intelligible point there. Let's fast forward. I want to hear what he says about it. scientific evidence. There we go. Completely untrue. Meat is most definitely not essential, despite what... So meat's just not essential. There you go, guys. We've got Ryan, politician Ryan, happy, healthy, vegan. Put my bong away so I can get more votes. Check out my whammy bar. You got Ryan, happy, healthy, vegan, says meat's not essential. So it must be not essential, even though 97% of the people in the world eat meat. They, they're going to say it's non-essential now. But what is essential? You're going to have your essential bananas. You're going to have your essential imported foods. You can eat your, here's your kibble, cheesy broccoli chowder. Cheese is non-essential though, right? But vegan cheese is essential. Sun-dried hummus sandwiches with chickpeas mass-produced. Mass-produced monocrop chickpeas. Most non-vegans and non-vegetarians may believe uh, just let me say it here in case you've never heard this before. You do not need to eat meat or dairy or eggs or any other animal product. Oh, you don't need to. Just, so you don't need to. You don't need to have social contact with people. You don't need to leave your house. I get, we don't need to breathe either, do we, Ryan? We don't need to breed or breathe. We don't need any of that. Life is not essential. So there you go. Politician Ryan. You guys can go comment on his video if you'd like. Ryan, I would love to have you on the show sometime. Come on, and we can talk about your political campaign. We can talk about the morality and ethics of veganism. 
They can talk about your stupid, fake moral calculus. Top comment. People always accuse vegans of caring more about animals than people, but I don't know a single meat eater who would boycott meat to protest this and save other human lives. It's just always with this Orwellian, oh, we have to stop producing meat to save human lives. We have to take away people's jobs to save human lives. We have to lock everyone in their homes and lock their children away and take their children from them if we need to to save lives. We've got mothers who are giving birth in hospitals. And if they test positive, remember, the, there's a high false positive um, uh, rate on these tests, <laughs> the PCR test which the maker of the PCR test, the inventor of it, said that it shouldn't be used to diagnose diseases and viruses. This test that just tests for trace genetic material. We're told that. It's not that we're told. This is being done. Women are being separated from their newborn babies because they're testing positive. This is absurd. We've got another super chat. Helen Guilford. Helen Guilford sends... 9.99. Really appreciate that, Helen. I don't know if I already read that one. But she didn't even say anything. She said 9.99. I want to thank all you guys for supporting this non-essential stream of essential information. And let's all make sure to just let's clap. Let's clap for the essential workers. Let's clap for the essential politicians, like Ryan. Let's clap for these people. Ah, here we go, guys. One, one moment, we're going to transition, we're going to have RCAF, USA, Bill Bullard is coming on right now, let me just uh, introduce Bill in a moment, you guys hold on for a second, give me one minute, we are about to start, he's punctually on time, which I am usually not for these live streams, and I really appreciate Bill coming on, now let me uh, transition over here, and I'll be right back, uh, and then Bill's going to talk to us for about an hour about the food supply, the broken food supply chain, and what's going on here, and what's really going on with these meat shortages, and where all, where's all the beef? Where is all the beef, and why do we see this happening? I'll be right back. Bear with me. Uh, you know what? I'm gonna I'm gonna use my headphones so that they don't get backlash and have to hear the audio twice. But here we are. We've got Bill Bullard here from RCAF USA. We're gonna talk a little bit about RCAF, his organization, what they do, what they're involved in, on the front lines of trying to get our uh, our food supply back into the hands of the producers and. Uh, get a, you know, a better situation for both the consumers and the producers of beef. Uh, Bill Bullard, thank you so much for joining us. How are you today, sir? I'm fine. Thanks for having me. Yeah, really appreciate you coming on. I'm glad you could take some time out of your day. Um, let's first of all start out with RCAF. What is RCAF and what are you guys all about? RCAF is a national trade association and it's the largest national trade association that exclusively represents the interests of the farmers and ranchers who actually raise and sell cattle. The beef supply chain is multi-segmented and the live cattle producer is the beginning of that chain and that's who we represent. We don't represent the meat packers and processors and distributors and the retailers as other organizations try to do. So we've got over 5,400 members in 43 states. They're family farmers and ranchers raising cattle, working hard, taking care of the, the land, air and water and uh, hoping that when their cattle are ready to market, that they have a market to market into. And what we're finding today is that's not the case. So when you say having a market to market into, what is preventing the producers to have a market to market into? What are the forces behind this? And what has been happening that's blocking the ability of this beef to get to the market and therefore get into our hands and in our bellies and to feed our families? Well, would you like me to try to do a share screen to look at a, a chart here that might be helpful for that to answer Perfect. that question? Absolutely. So 
let's consider the, the the U.S. cattle industry as a huge pyramid or triangle. It's the largest single segment of American agriculture. It generates about sixty-seven billion dollars annually from the sale of live cattle. And so our industry is the economic cornerstones for rural America, all of rural America. We have cattle in every state, largest segment of American ag, tremendously important to the economic well-being. So if we look at the industry itself, at the base of the pyramid, we have about three quarters of a million cattle producers, farmers and ranchers who raise and sell cattle, still remaining in operations today, scattered all across the United States. So widely disaggregated, this is the family farm system of agriculture that has generated, has been the envy of the world because of our efficiencies and abilities to continue to produce abundant, safe food at affordable prices. That's been uh, the United States' huge success as a family farm system. So we still have that here, at least skeletonized, because we used to have millions. Now we have about three quarters of a million left. So, our industry down here takes care of the mother cows and mother cows like humans have a gestation rate of nine months. So after they breed the cow, they'll have a calf after nine months, then the calf will hit the ground and will suckle the mother for four to six months. And all of these cow calf producers would be raising all these baby calves. And then once they're four to six months old, they'll begin to move up the pyramid into the next level of the supply chain and there the animals would be purchased by another family farmer and ranch or rancher, and they would be fed for another four to six months. So you're generating, we have about uh, 28 million head of calves born every year, about 25, 26 million of those work their way up to the pyramid until we get to that first black line. So that's the final segment of the live cattle supply chain. That's where the animals are fed from about 900 pounds when they enter the feedlot sector until they're 13 to 1400 pounds where they're slaughtered by the meat packers. So this is a huge bottleneck that we're seeing in our industry. All these 25 million cattle working their way up the pyramid and they get to this first section. And that's where we have the, the family sized feedlots, farmer feeders with relatively small operations. They raise their own feed. They feed the cattle. So this is all a very uh, closely symbiotic, if you will, um, relationship in the, in the raising, the birthing, the raising, the growing of these cattle. And then they enter the feedlot sector and the second black line represents the mid-sized to very, very large cattle feedlots where we have tremendous concentration and they feed 87% of all of these 25 million cattle. But the market I'm speaking of, John, is the market when these 25 million cattle are ready to be processed into a consumable beef product, into food. These 25 million cattle are, or 85% of all of these cattle are controlled by just four packers. So at the peak of the pyramid, 85% of the 25 million cattle will be sold to just four multinational packers, Tyson, Cargill, JBS, and National Beef control 85% of this entire industry. So there's the bottleneck. So the question today, why do cattle producers here and here and here have cattle to market, but no market to enter into? It's because we have so skeletonized the meatpacking industry that right now, these four packers that operate about 24 plants, they are so large in size that if any one plant shuts down, or if there's any slowdown in production, you create a bottleneck right here that is reverberates all the way through this industry and that's what's happened. We have cattle producers here who have animals that weigh 13 to 1400 pounds. They've been trying to sell them for five weeks. None of these four packers will give them a bit. So these animals are gaining weight on a daily basis. They're losing value. Um, we, we have to figure out how to keep the system going. But when this blockage occurs, everyone behind it backs, backs up too. So that's what we're seeing in our industry. And that's why today we have cattle producers who have worked for many, many months to raise an animal ready for, for harvest. And yet there's no market to market into today.
Well, wow, that's really well said. So succinct. Um, all right, there's, a, there's actually there's a lot to unpack there. And um, sorry, I know it's a little confusing. Uh, you know, we, we talked earlier. It, it's, it's not John, it's Tristan. I, John is just the name on this Skype account. Oh, so I'm sorry. Sorry for the confusion, man. Yeah, yeah, no, no problem, Bill. And I'm not offended at all. Just the, the audience might be like, who's John? <laughs> um, yeah, that's my, uh, that's my, my pseudonym over here on, on Zoom. So, all right, so four major multinational corporations owning this bottleneck situation, but how, how long has the, um, the feedlot system been going on as well? Because this seems like it's something that's also relatively new. It seems like something that, and you mentioned efficiency, and um, you know efficiency is kind of what a lot of these multinational corporations are also using as an apologetics for further consolidation and vertical integration. Right? So they say, look, look how efficient this is. Cargill owns this much of the slaughter facility. Cargill also is, uh, owns a massive portion of the international grain trade. Um, do you think that there, what do you think about you know, grass-fed beef, uh, grass-finished beef and stuff like that? Do you think that that's a model that could also help to alleviate this major bottleneck that's going on there? Because we have a lot of people who are watching this who are you know, looking at even producing their own food at home now, people starting to homestead. Uh, we've talked to a lot of grass-fed cattle ranchers who they also critique the consolidation of the slaughter industry, but then they're very critical of also, you know, corn and, uh, you know, the, the, the big inputs required for industrial agriculture. So, um, sorry, that's a big loaded question, but what, what, go ahead and unpack that for us. Well, well, if the answer to the question, what do we think of that? We think it's great. Um, we have an industry that can provide um, what many different consumers want. Some consumers want grain fed beef. Some would rather have grass-fed, somewhat organic, somewhat antibiotic-free. Um, and so we are an industry that, because we still have the semblance of a family farm independent structure, where we have independent businesses making independent decisions, we can be flexible and meet those demands that the consumers are making. Hmm. But if we allow our industry to continue on the trajectory that it's on, we're following the vertical integration trajectory that the poultry and hog industries have already traversed. If we follow that, we will lose that flexibility. We would lose that opportunity to, to be responsive to consumer demands. Uh, instead, we would be a top-down, centrally controlled entity that that works um, at the breakneck spree speed. And that's what we have in the poultry and hog industries. And unlike our industry, while we're still trying to uh, move these heavyweight cattle that are getting heavier all the time, in those vertical integrated industries, they're killing animals, they're killing poultry, they're killing hogs. It's because they have such a factory assembly line that is so time sensitive that if any one portion of that 11 month cycle in the hog industry, for example, if anything backs up, everything behind it just jams right into it and they have to, they have to find an outlet. Um, that's not the family farm system way of agriculture. That's not what we did half a lifetime ago. Half a lifetime ago, 1980, we had hundreds of thousands of more cattle producers. We had tens of thousands of more independent feedlots feeding these cattle. We had hundreds of more meat packers. But over the course of half a lifetime, and you said this didn't happen all that uh, long ago, you're absolutely right. Uh, this, this is a recent phenomenon. The United States government handed over, our Congress and our federal agencies handed over to the meat packers the authority to shape the food system that benefited them. And that's exactly what they did. They skeletonized what used to be a very resilient and redundant food system. They brought it down to the bare bones. They created economic efficiencies and economies of scale by being so large that if anyone closed down, you're done. And what we found out is what, what maximizes the multinational meatpacker shareholders uh, profits is not what's good for America. Yeah. It puts the United States at risk of not being able to uh, maintain food security. It puts us at risk if there is a foodborne illness breakout, it's going to affect millions of people in a heartbeat. It's because that's not the way a food system should be designed, but it's precisely how our Congress and our presidents in the past and our federal agencies have allowed our food system to be essentially taken over, designed and operated in a manner that benefits the, the multinationals. And now, if you look at our cattle industry, four of those big packers that control 85% of the industry, 
Of those four, two are Brazilian owned or controlled. Uh, in the hog industry, the new American farmer is now communist China, mm -hmm. largest pork producer in the United States, Smithfield Farms. Yeah. Where we've been asleep at the wheel for a long time, and it's and this COVID nineteen is finally waking people up because never in history has consumers gone to the grocery store and not been able to buy the food that they want. And now we've reached even the next level. Now they go to some of the grocery stores; they're not able to buy the food they need. This is getting extremely serious, and it is time yeah. that the people push Congress hard enough to make them act. And we've not done that yet, but I think the time is here. Yeah, so uh, speaking of which, speaking of uh, pushing back at Congress, uh, the PRIME Act is something that uh, has been coming up a little bit lately. I've seen, uh, I've read a couple articles on it, but I'm not exactly clear on if this would be national or how this would actually work. What do you think about the PRIME Act? And are there any other ways that we could take as far as you know uh, changing uh, the legal framework and how this works so that we can get food to the consumer you know, easily. We've got a lot of people here who are going directly to farms, but a lot of these farms, they can't send it over state lines. There's, there's a lot of loops that they got to jump through. So right. how could we fix this? So organizations like RCAF USA and several others got together back in the early 2000s. And in the 2008 Farm Bill, we tried to pass legislation to allow state inspected meat processing plants. So in every state of the union, you have your state local government that does the inspections and they're not allowed to ship beef in interstate commerce. So they're limited in terms of their ability to compete with the big meat packers. And that's the way the big meat packers want it to continue. So it was a huge fight to provide an opportunity for state inspected beef plants to ship beef in interstate commerce. Now remember, we can, we can import beef from Z Namibia, Africa, um, Honduras, Costa Rica, Nicaragua, Uruguay. And once it crosses the border, it's free to go in any state of the union. But if a beef product that's inspected by a Colorado state government or a Texas state government uh, is, is approved meeting safety standards, it has to be sold only within that state, cannot be sold across state lines. So we discriminate against our own individual states when you look at this as comparison to the imported products. And so in 2008, they actually passed the legislation that would streamline the ability for state plants to ship beef across state lines. But the meat packers through the US Department of Agriculture rulemaking process made it such a cumbersome process that very few states were even able to comply. Mm -hmm. So when the COVID virus struck and, and we sent a letter to the president, he said, one of the first things you need to do is streamline the regulatory uh, bureaucracy that these small plants need to work through in order to ship beef across state lines. We've got, we've got small processors that are right across the state line and they can't ship beef to the customers that want it. So that's one thing. The Prime Act that you speak of is one that would allow a state, a smaller custom packing facility, very small with very few employees. Right now, if they slaughter an animal for you, you have to own the animal that is slaughtered and then you receive the meat, but it can't be sold. So the Prime Act would allow these custom slaughtering and processing operations to actually harvest an animal and sell the beef within the state. So that's what this is, it's national, and it helps to eliminate that bottleneck that we have where uh, we have cattle ready to be harvested, but no one capable of harvesting them. And as you said, uh, customers, consumers, we just don't have enough producers selling directly. In the middle of March, when, the, when we first start, saw the uh, photographs of people with empty beef, beef cases at the grocery stores, yeah. We set up at our office an, an internet platform and invited cattle producers across the country who did sell beef directly to consumers and small processors and butchers to include their contact information on this internet platform. And then we would invite consumers to go to that, look up their state, find a producer who can produce beef and buy beef directly from the producer. And one of the, the caveat or the requirement that we imposed on them is you have to sell beef that is exclusively born, raised, and harvested in the United States because we want to help American farmers and ranchers and we want American consumers to be able to buy the best beef in the world produced under the best conditions. 
And so we have over 370 producers on that list now from 41 states. Wow. Um, we, we just have been so busy working on other matters that we haven't gone back and circled back to see, well, uh, how many consumers are you, are you uh, bought out uh, or do you still, are you still able to continue providing beef? So we're trying in a small way. Uh, we were surprised at how big this small way turned out with 370 some producers. Um, but, but this is a wake up call for America. Uh, we goofed. It, we made a huge mistake. Let's fix it. Let's fix it now. And that's what we're working on. We're working on reversing this negative trajectory that we've been on for far too long. And I want to big one thing up. When you talked about the economies of scale and efficiencies, mm. you're exactly right. That's why the government has not enforced our antitrust laws, our uh, mm. laws to preserve and protect competition. It's because they said they justified it with efficiency. Well, we created this economy of scale. We far surpassed any level of, of efficiency. What we've now done is moved into a new era of called market abuse. So now what, what they're still calling market efficiency is really abuse of market power being exercised in violation of our antitrust laws and other laws designed to preserve and protect competition. And that's why we filed a lawsuit, our cattle producing members, Filed a lawsuit a year ago in April, long before the COVID virus, long before the uh, Holcomb, Kansas fire that disrupted the marketplace. We recognize that our marketplace has been dysfunctional and our industry has been in a crisis since 2015. So we filed an historic antitrust lawsuit alleging that the big four meat packers that control 85% of the market um, have conspired, have violated our U.S. antitrust laws and the Packers and Stockyards Act by conspiring to artificially depress cattle prices paid to producers while simultaneously inflating their own profits and margins. So that mm. is that's some of the, that's the most important corrective action we can make is to stop the manipulation and the unlawful practices that we allege are occurring in our marketplace today and have been since 2015. Wow. And you, how, how did that lawsuit go? What was the result of this lawsuit that you brought? Well, like, like legislation itself, lawsuits are very slow. So yeah. we filed the lawsuit uh, a year ago in April. Several others, um, representatives of the industry jumped in. Other cattle producers, other segments of the industry. So there were a lot of lawsuits that followed ours. And then that required us to go back to the courts and consolidate those that were very similar. So nice. that consolidation took several months to occur. Uh, we're currently in the motions to dismiss phase. The meat packers have argued that we essentially did not present to the court a legally arguable case that would justify the court spending time to carry the, the case forward. So we're, all the briefing is done in those motions to dismiss. And the court has now scheduled a hearing for our oral arguments on June 8th in Minneapolis. So our case will be heard. So the case is pending, uh, but unfortunately with the immediate problems that producers are facing today, the, the lawsuit is not going to address the producer's inability to find a, a purchaser for their cattle, for example. Yeah, so, yeah. So it's, 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 it's more of a long-term long strategy, right? It seems like the lawsuit is more of a, uh, a longer-term thing. Is that a bee that just landed on the camera there? Actually, it was a fly in the barn. It looked, Sorry yeah, about that. It was like it looked it was yellow. It looked like a bee. Uh, well, that's great. Um, all right. So, speaking of the uh, the consolidation of the food industry and like the the supply lines getting kind of choked out and cut off today, uh, even before this, we were seeing pretty high prices on beef. But then you're saying, and a lot of other ranchers have been saying that they've been getting record low prices per pound and per head of cattle that they're selling. So how is it, and what the heck is going on here? Who's making the money? When people, I mean, the ranchers aren't able to sell their beef. They're not getting the prices that they should be for the beef they're selling. And then the end consumer and the people who are eating it are paying more. How does this happen and why does this happen? Well, if we can, can we go back to charts again? Yes, sir. I have a chart that helps to explain this. So... Um, so what we're looking at here is a chart that starts on a monthly basis in July of 2009. So we're talking after the recessionary period we had in 2008 and nine. And the red line represents cattle prices on a monthly basis over time. So we start in July of 2009, we go all the way 
to uh, March of 2020 here. So you see that after the recessionary period, cattle prices started to work their way upward. We had a clearly an upward trend. And so uh, in conjunction with this, we also track beef prices. So the red line represents the price that the cattle producer receives for his or her cattle. But the blue graphs represent the consumer price of beef that the consumers pay at the grocery store. So this is the all fresh retail value, for example. Yeah. So after the recession, we saw that uh, cattle prices were trending upward. And as you would expect, when the input price is increasing in value, you would expect the final product to increase in value as well. And that's exactly what happened. Uh, retail beef prices followed the increasing cattle prices after the recession. And then we hit the end of 2014. And at that point, cattle producers received the highest nominal prices for their cattle in the history of their industry. This was a record. But after their prices hit the peak and then began to inexplicably collapse for many, many months, retail beef prices kept climbing for another eight months. So even after cattle prices collapsed, Retail prices continued upward. And then they began to follow cattle prices downward for a moment. And when they recovered, they started trending upward. You can see that this is definitely an upward trend. Right now, we're almost back to $6 a pound for retail beef prices. But look at the cattle producers' prices. Today, they're under at $95 cash price today for fed cattle. This is where they were clear back in 2010, a decade ago. So cattle producers are receiving seriously depressed prices, totally um, disconnected from the value of beef. And for the past three years, retail beef prices, this is 2017, 17, 18, 19, 20, retail beef prices have been steadily climbing. 17, 18, 19, 20, cattle producer prices have been steadily declining. This is evidence of a broken market. It's evidence of market failure. It's a dysfunctional market. And it is clearly, it manifests itself as a marketplace in which the, the only ingredient to the final product is no longer connected to the final product because the only ingredient in beef is cattle. And uh, there's an absolute and complete disconnect that has occurred. And remember, this occurred back at the beginning of 2015, hence the reason we have alleged that this is the period in which this entire period where the spread between the retail prices and the producer prices has been the widest in history, the period in which we allege that the collusion occurred um, in the marketplace. Well said, well said. So, it's, I mean, it seems like grocery stores have a huge markups right now, right? I mean, the, the, the beef on the shelf, it, it's being sold for much higher prices. Cattle producers, ranchers are not getting what they need to get for their animals. In fact, I mean, some of them are even being told to cull their animals as well. I mean, can we get into this? Why are we just, we just listened to, uh, I think it was, was it Shad? Uh, he was a regional, Sullivan. yeah, Shad Sullivan, uh, regional director of RCAF and uh, RCAF US, USA rather. And he was talking about producers being told to depopulate and cull their animals while Namibian beef and beef from Brazil and other countries is flooding the market. I mean, we've talked about the, the Australian beef flooding the market recently and how that negatively affects both Australians and Americans. But um, yeah, what is going on here with you know, the, the beef that's flooding the market from external, uh, from other countries? And how is that affecting the, uh, the cattle producer and the end consumer, the price that they pay? Okay, so um, the first is when USDA issued the notice uh, to the livestock industry, meaning, and the poultry industry, poultry, hogs, sheep, cattle, uh, were issued the notice. And the USDA said that, um, you know, we're at a point where, where we need to provide you help in depopulating um, if that occurs. And that's exactly what occurs in the hog and the poultry industry. They had to euthanize animals. They had to abort uh, pigs. It's because that was the vertically integrated industrialized supply chain that is so far removed from the family farm system of agriculture, it's unrecognizable. But that's the system that was unable to respond at all. No resiliency, no redundancy. 
when they could not bring those hogs to the meat processor because of the illness that the workers had experienced as a result of COVID-19, when those plants slowed down production, um, they literally uh, broke the entire supply chain. And so that's why they had to kill the animals that would should have otherwise gone on in the processor. The reason they did that is because they had other animals coming on the backside, hmm. coming into those uh, that segment of their supply chain. Same thing with the poultry industry. Those are so um, vertically integrated, top-down controlled. You know, decisions are made in the smoking boardrooms. Uh, they're not made by the family farmers and ranchers anymore. Yeah. So the cattle industry is different. So we're, as we said, we still have the flexibility because we still have the critical mass of independent producers with three quarters of a million of them scattered across the United States. We have the ability to rebuild our industry, uh, one that works for consumers as well as for producers. And, uh, and at this point, we haven't been told as an industry to begin calling those animals. In fact, what the industry has been doing is saying, slow down the feeding ration. Mm -hmm. Try to slow down the growth of your animals. For those of you who are uh, have the calves on mother cows, you may want to hold them a little bit longer on the mother cows. Maybe mm -hmm. don't wean early, maybe wean and start feeding early. For those who are in the middle with yearling aged animals moving up the supply chain, they're saying slow the growth down, you know, put them back out on grass. So we have the ability to be flexible and to meet crises like this where the other sectors don't because they're already vertically integrated. So that's a lesson for all of us that that was a huge experiment and a mistake. Don't do it again. Let's go back to what worked. Let's go back to having hundreds of thousands of disaggregated producers that are processing animals in local communities uh, in close proximity to the consumers and have a distribution system that is redundant and, and resilient. If one if a crisis strikes in one area, if it be a human or animal-borne disease strikes in an area or weather disaster, then we could pick up the slack with all of these other hundreds of other packers. But you can't do that in today's uh, under today's structure. I might have yeah. gone off, off track a bit on your. No, questions. I think you're I think you're right on track. No, this is that's exactly what I was asking. I think uh, sometimes sometimes I'll throw too many threads there in the question. It could be hard to unravel it. But uh, yeah, so. Going back to the uh, the vertically integrated model, something that I've been really uh, something that's been really irritating me is that we see this big push for they call it plant based meat now, but it's basically it's processed corn and soy and mass produced uh, monocrop grains that are heavily processed into uh, you know fake meat alternatives that taste like crap and they make you fart all day. Um, you know, far less nourishing, far less tasty, far less healthy. Uh, both for ourselves and environmentally as well, product. What do you think about, I mean, you've got Cargill, uh, Tyson Foods, heavily invested in this plant-based meat push, right? So you've got this bottleneck that's created, that's pushing out the small family rancher, that's helped the consolidation. I mean, there's less people ranching now than there were um, you know, 30, 40 years ago. You have less ranchers. You even have less head of cattle. Right, so you have less production. I mean, a less a less decentralized system, a more consolidated system, driven by this bottleneck of the four big processors. Those same processors, many of them are also involved in the production of plant-based meat, in the promotion of the idea that plant-based meats, so-called plant-based meat and fake milk, should be not just subsidized, but that meat should be taxed, right? You've got the World Business Council for Sustainable Development talking about we need to bring about carbon taxes and have a sin tax on meat. The World Economic Forum is promoting this idea as well. And Cargill and Tyson Foods are invested. I mean, Tyson was one of the biggest investors in Beyond Meat. Um, this to me is, is very indicative of not only industry collusion, but also, I mean, these, it seems like this bottleneck doesn't mind choking out the American uh, uh, consumer because they've got an alternative that's more profitable, uh, that is much more consolidated and it cuts out, you know, hard, uh, pesky little rural people like yourself who um, own these family farms. So what do you think about this and where do you think this plant-based meat movement is going and how does this affect the producer? Well, what you described is irreconcilable. Uh, you, you can't justify the, the fact that these small, large multinational meat packers are themselves leading this charge to provide an alternative protein source 
with which to undercut the prices of all the American farmers and ranchers who are who've been relying upon these four huge entities uh, as their only marketplace. But let's unpack this even further. So back in the mid 80s, um, the meat packers worked with Congress and passed a law and said that for every live animal a cattle producer sells, they have to pay a dollar. It's a dollar tax. So every animal that sells, we sell 25 million fed cattle, that's 25 million. Then we sell several uh, million head of, of cows. So on an annual basis, we actually raise about $80 million with this. Well, the money is used to promote generic beef, not, not USA beef, not necessarily beef produced by the US cattle mm. farm and rancher, but beef, whether it came from Uruguay, Namibia, Australia, New Zealand, Mexico, Canada, any one of the 20 countries we import from. So they, they pay this dollar. Well, because they're promoting generic beef and, and who's selling that beef? Well, it's Tyson, Cargill, JBS, and National Beef. It's the big beef packers. So they're getting um, essentially upwards of $80 million a year from a mandatory tax by the federal government in order to promote a product that you know, in other industries like Ford and Chevy and Toyota, they all, you know, they all advertise their own. Well, the cattle producers are advertising beef for these big beef packers. And now, because they haven't had to spend the money to advertise and promote beef, they're able to redirect all the money they saved into the development of an alternative fake meat process to compete directly against the producers. <laughs> that that makes this even further irreconcilable. Uh, yeah. So this is a huge problem. But one very, very important thing. Uh, America with 329 million people, you know, we have a lot of diversity. Some people might prefer uh, a non-meat-based food. We know they exist. Uh, and that's their choice. And, and just as it is in a free enterprise system to allow new entrepreneurs to enter uh, the marketplace, we promote that. So we're not going to stop the development of these alternative protein sources. But what we need to do is make sure that consumers are not being deceived by them. Uh, for consumers who want an all natural product, you're not going to get that in a processed product. You would get that in a cut of lamb or a cut of beef. Um, so that's important. So the consumer cannot be deceived in the process. That means you can't label this stuff, this alternative protein as beef or meat or a, a steak or a chuck roast. You've got to name it something that says this is not a, a, a natural product. This is something else. Um, so, but, but very importantly, and then there has to be something wrong with the multinational meat packers who are the only market for the producers who are receiving a subsidy from the government and then they're turning around and undercutting the domestic producers price. That's just terrible. Uh, yeah. But that's the world we live in. Well, and it's really like the corn and the, you know, the, the mass produced crops are also subsidized by the governments and those are all going into making these cheap products, making them cheaper. While the government isn't doing much to stop the, you know, the, the price gouging or whatever you want to call it that's going on at these supermarkets as the U.S. producer is cut off from being able to supply the consumer. So to me, this seems like very, very, I mean, I, I, I'm surprised there's not a lawsuit going on to expose, you know, this. You know, this is some obviously a very heavy handed industry collusion going on here. And um, you've got these big grain monopolies who have taken over uh, and, the, and bottlenecked the beef production industry while trying to destroy it, or at least um, you know, trying to provide an alternative and force it to be cheaper through this backroom dealing. It's, it's just ridiculous. I mean, you've got you know, Bill Gates, uh, the biggest funder of Beyond Meat, and also involved in um, one of the biggest investors in Beyond Meat. I'm not sure if he got out of it or, or what, but I think Tyson Foods did get out, and now they're trying to produce their own meat uh, alternatives, plant-based meat, they call it. But you've also got, um, excuse me, Bill Gates promoting and investing in Memphis meat, which is lab-grown meat. So where do you see this going? I mean, we've got, you've got a lot of big economic interests who are pushing the idea of subsidizing lab-grown meat, of putting a sin tax on beef. They're saying your livestock are bad for the planet. You know, I mean, we got to tax the, uh, the, uh, your, the toots and the burps from your animals and they're destroying the world while talking about lab-grown meat, which is going to be way more expensive to make. And uh, are, are you concerned with this lab-grown meat stuff at all? What do you think about this stuff? 
Well, for the same reason, um, obviously it's, it's something that will compete against uh, the protein that is the natural protein that our members produce and we have for generations. Um, so the, the labeling on that lab grown, like the artificial uh, product, the vegetable base, the lab grown needs to be even further disclosed in terms of what it really is. Uh, because it isn't meat, it isn't beef, it isn't derived, it isn't a muscle cut from an animal. And uh, unfortunately, I think the advertising and promotion is likely going to try to deceive consumers into thinking, well, uh, this is just as good as beef. Well, if that's the case, then eat beef. Um, you know, that's what we're dealing with. So, so we just have to be careful that we can't stop innovation. Um, there are some things, of course, that we can do with science that we ought not be doing. At least some of us believe that's the case. Mm -hmm. And uh, th this happens to be one that I personally believe is, is the case. Um, you know, God made uh, an opportunity for us to find natural beef, and we know how to do it. Yeah. And so I think what you're looking at is, you know, that's the uh, entrepreneurial spirit. But I think sometimes we go too far. But that's up for the consumer to make those choices. And we yeah. want to make sure that they're clearly able to make that choice. And, and that's why, for example, even in our industry of the natural products, the actual real beef, um, we have these this beef coming in from 20 different countries. And we have a government that's allowing, uh, for example, a beef a beef product from Uruguay comes into the United States in an 80 pound box. It comes into a US packing plant and it's taken out of the 80 pound box and put in 10 pound boxes. Well, when they put it in the 10 pound box, they throw away the Uruguayan label and they can put a product of USA label on. <laughs> so consumers do not know where their beef comes from, even if it's labeled as a product of the USA. And it's because our government for a quarter century has been trying to promote and facilitate more imports of cheaper undifferentiated beef from around the world into the United States. And they're still doing that, even as the president is fighting the, the Chinese cheating and the Chinese theft of our intellectual property and the devaluation of our currency. Even while the president's doing that, the U.S. Department of Agriculture didn't get the memo that we're supposed to change this stupid globalization policy yeah. and we need to start supporting American producers. Well, they didn't get that, that memo, so they now they're bringing beef from Namibia, Africa, where they're bringing beef from Brazil. Now, these are two countries that harbor one of the most uh, contagious diseases known to cloven-footed animals like cattle. It's called foot and mouth disease. And it's arguably more contagious than COVID-19, more contagious to cattle than COVID-19 is to humans. Yeah, but does and it have does it have a 97, was it a 99.7% survival rate like, uh, like COVID does, or is it worse than that? Well, it's worse on young animals. Uh, okay. It disrupts production to the point, you might recall in the mid 2000s that Europe had a foot and mouth disease outbreak okay. and they, they killed millions of animals and many farmers in, in Europe committed suicide. They could not handle the stress of having to kill you know, their life's work. Um, and it was a sad, sad deal, but that's the devastation that this particular disease, foot and mouth disease, uh, can bring about to entire uh, industries. And so we had an outbreak in 1929 of this disease. It was in Los Angeles, it arrived here from an Argentinian cruise ship and there was an outbreak. And as a result, we had to depopulate uh, deer because they too have two toes like a, like a cow. Uh, had to uh, depopulate hogs and cattle. So we killed millions of head of livestock, spent millions of dollars. We eradicated the disease. And from that point forward, we said, we're simply not going to trade with countries that harbor this disease because it can be carried in the meat, uh, the virus itself. Mm -hmm. And so we went along for many years until, as I said, we decided, well, let's start facilitating more imports of this cheaper, undifferentiated beef in order to undercut the U.S. producer. That's got to be good for the consumer because the consumer is going to get more choices and cheaper beef. That was the there's the, the, the theory behind this 25 year effort that's still underway. So what we're doing is now we've decided, well, we'll relax our restrictions against countries that have foot and mouth disease like Namibia, Africa, and like Brazil. And if it ever hits the United States, we'll just address it then. Kind of like they said they could address COVID-19 that shut our economy down. 
In other words, this is an absolutely unnecessary and avoidable risk that our government is putting us uh, at, uh, subject to on a regular basis. And the importation of beef is one of them. So one of the things that we think that we need to do to reverse this entire negative trend is we need to give consumers, Americans, the opportunity to support the American family farmer and rancher. And the way they can do that is to buy beef that is exclusively born, raised, and harvested right here in America. But they can't do that today because the labels are deceiving. Yeah. And so we've uh, initiated a petition at www.demandusabeef.com. That's demandusabeef.com. We now have over 342,000 signatures on that petition, and it's calling upon Congress and the president to immediately require mandatory country of origin labels on all beef, mm -hmm. pork, and dairy products sold in America so the American consumer can choose from what country they want their beef and pork uh, either born, raised, and harvested, or their dairy products either sourced, processed, and uh, uh, supplied. So th this is essential. And, and right now, the meat packers have fought us vehemently against uh, restoration of mandatory country of origin labeling because they benefit uh, financially when they can source 3.2 uh, billion pounds of beef from 20 different countries and bring it into the United States and sell it to unsuspecting consumers as if it were an American product. We need to turn that around immediately. And that's what our petition is for. So if you're listening, please go to our petition and, and join on and then share it with your friends. We want to get a half a million uh, can, uh, American citizens and American cattle producers on that petition to finally get Congress to, to act. Nice, nice. And what's the URL for that one more time? I think people in the audience would love to go sign that petition. It is www.demandusabeef.com. Great. Demand okay. USABeef.com. I'm going to type this in the chat right now, the live chat, so you guys can go and check out that petition. Some people in the chat are also wondering, um, what is the website? You mentioned the database that you guys were uh, drawing up of these producers who do sell beef uh, and who you can get beef from more directly and cut out some of these middlemen who are uh, choking out the food supply. How can people learn about that? Yes, that uh, address is www.usabeef.org, usabeef.org, right. so O-R-G. And then that was, was it demandusabeef.com? All right. Yes. All right, great. Um, all right, so the lab-grown meat, I think we agree on that one, but what if it's uh, the Los Angeles Times? They just put out this article, and uh, I'm looking at it right now. I don't have it pulled up on the screen, but it's uh, LA, LA Times. Ellen DeGeneres Salami, one company's quest to make meat from celebrity tissue samples. Surely you would want to eat Ellen DeGeneres Salami rather than U.S. beef, right? Well, that, that's among the list of those things we can do with science, but we ought not to. <laughs> I'd agree. I'd agree. Uh, Bill Bullard, I, I really appreciate you coming on here and, uh, and chatting with us. Um, I'm going to let you go and get on with your day. I uh, greatly appreciate the time you spent uh, educating the audience here on what's going on. And uh, you know, I hope more people start to support local producers and support the work that organizations like RCAF are doing. I think you guys are, are butting heads with groups like the NCBA, like you mentioned earlier, the National Cattlemen's Beef Association, that's you know, taking tax money that the producers put into it and then using that tax money to undercut the producers and try to put them out of business. Um, and uh, yeah, I hope you guys keep doing the work that you're doing. And um, I'd love to talk to you in the future if anything new comes up. But I think a lot of people here have been uh, quite stimulated by the conversation. And where can they find more? We mentioned those two websites. Is there anywhere else that they can find you? And is there anything else that you think that people should be uh, aware about that's coming down the pipeline? Well, um, we're, we're going to get country of origin labeling passed with everyone's help. So we need you to sign up so we can recontact you when we have legislation beginning to work its way through Congress. So um, we need to set the stage today so we can fix the problems that have now been uh, shined upon with a floodlight as a result of COVID-19. But we didn't get in this mess overnight. 
and it's going to take us longer than a week or two to get out of it. In other words, this is long term. We want to develop a relationship between the cattle producers and the American citizen that we've never had before because we both have the same interests. So we need to provide food and you want food. Uh, we need to be working together like we've never worked before because not working together has resulted in what we have today and that's a broken system. And so I don't have the answer, Tristan, as to exactly what uh, needs to be said other than stay tuned, we wanna work with you and we need to because uh, this is too important for our children and our grandchildren we've got to fix this mess and we need the american citizen to, to stand with us to do that all right i think there's a bunch of people who are watching right now who do want to stand with you i've got i got a friend of mine he's a he's a grass-fed cattle rancher over there in texas and he's one of these guys we mentioned earlier people who are uh you know very passionate about uh, re reducing this, uh, getting rid of this bottleneck that's uh, cutting off the suppliers from those, uh, from the consumers, the people at home who want to eat good quality beef. He's asking about your thoughts on like the corn industry. Do you do you think they got a dog in this fight? You think that the um, you know what people call king corn um, has a um, an interest in some of the proceedings that we're seeing here and the uh, the, the bottlenecking of the production and and all this? Where do you think corn sits in the mix? Well, um, so the corn industry relies heavily on the livestock industry because the livestock industry is the number one buyer of corn. And so there's a close uh, relationship between the two industries. Uh, the, like you indicated earlier, that the corn industry is a subsidized industry. And so the producers receive a government price support, and that's so that the processor can buy that cheaper than what a competitive market would, would uh, establish. And, and so that industry functions different than our industry because the cattle industry does not receive government price supports. And with the exception of the, the meat packers and the NCBA that receiving the uh, dollar tax mm -hmm. subsidy. Uh, but we don't receive price reports, our price supports. So we live and die by the competitive marketplace, by the law of economic law of supply and demand. And that's the way we want. It. So we, we, we kind of butt heads with the, you know, the corn industry in that regard, recognizing that, well, those prices aren't, uh, com competitive based, uh, they've got some government subsidies involved in them. So how do you unwind that? And, and so that's a long way of saying is, I don't know enough yet about that relationship with the corn industry, because we've been focused on, on the structural problems within the marketplace itself, as opposed to, you know, the, the purchase of, of, of corn within the industry. So I really don't have the expertise to be able to delve into that issue. Anymore. Cool. I'd like to learn more. Yeah, yeah, I think I think it's uh, I think it's a big issue there. I mean, it just it just seems to me like the uh, the subsidies of corn, subsidization of corn, kind of helped to create that bottleneck that started feeding into the tighter bottleneck by making you know less uh, you know bigger feedlots, more of a consolidated feedlot system. Which uh, you know, but whereas before when we didn't have such a consolidation, it might have favored the the producers a little bit more. And um, yeah, but Bill Bullard, interesting. Uh, Thank you so much for coming on. Really appreciate you taking your time out of your day. And I'm going to let you go. And uh, I'd love to have you on in the future. And um, guys, make sure to support the work that they're doing over there at RCAF. And uh, we'll put some links in the description below if you're listening to this at a later day. And um, thank you very much, Bill. Have a great day. You too. Thank you very much. Goodbye. Right. Bye, Bill. All right. So Bill Bullard, everybody. Bill Bullard from RCAF USA. Our calf USA, all right, guys. So what do you think about that? I know what Garment Farms thinks about it. He says, isn't the grain-fed beef industry taking a subsidy by buying subsidized cheap corn? Yeah, exactly. I think, I think that's, I think the corn industry most definitely plays a role in this. And it's, uh, you know, Bill Bullard, you could, I don't know, I just, I inherently, if a man's got a mustache like that and he has cows, I inherently trust them. If a dude's got a mustache like that, no cowboy hat, no cows, no livestock, you got no trust from me. But uh, Bill Bullard, he passes the test because he's got a cowboy hat, the mustache, and he's got actual cows. All right, so let me see here. I've got, where'd that go? There we go. So what do you guys think? Should we be supporting, if you live in the U.S., should you be supporting USA beef or should you be eating 
Ellen DeGeneres salami. Should we eating? Should we be eating um, lab-grown Bono beef steaks? <laughs> lab-grown Bono beef steaks and um, and Elton John uh, Elton John salami and Ellen salami, or should we be eating USA-made beef from cattle that are raised on grass locally? <laughs> I think you guys know where I stand on that. I've got some super chats over here, though. I want to thank you guys for support in the stream. It's always useful. We're going to keep going if you guys want to keep going. If we get some more thumbs up, if we get some more super chats, we're going to keep going. we got uh, Helen Guilford. No, we already read that one. We've got, there we go, Location 515. says, where's Greg Judy, you non-essential? Greg Judy's coming. I'm going to, I'll, I'll put a note into Jessica to schedule Greg Judy ASAP. Um, there's a few other of these guys that I'd love to get on. Maybe they have Justin Rhodes on. He's another channel that I really like and respect. And quite a few of these guys. Greg Judy's great. If you guys are looking for information on uh, on how to raise your own animals, how to actually make money, you don't even have to buy land. Greg Judy has shown how he has leased land, gotten long-term leases on land, produced good quality beef with very, very low monetary input, and then ended up buying that land and owning the land later on. Crazy, right? Uh, Dace Villela, thank you for the 199. What is that? What's R? Is that Rand? Is that Rand's? Is that like South African? I don't know. But thank you. Really appreciate the donation, the support there. Michael Angelo sends seven US dollars. Says simply for bringing this amazing information from a well educated man to the table. Yeah, uh, Bill, very gracious, very well spoken, and uh, just a solid dude with a solid mustache. You got based Bill Bullard over there. Ragamuffin Bear sends three bucks. And let me see if I can. There, just just sends three bucks. Ragamuffin Bear with with nothing that nice to say. Just sending them, just sending those non-essential dollars to this non-essential stream. All right. So um, a lot of people have already signed the petition. Good job, guys. Good job. So we were talking about we were talking about Ryan here from Happy Healthy Vegan. We're talking about the vegan response to all of this nonsense, and we've got. We've got a lot more to talk about here. I might have to do another stream soon. We've got... Where did that go? We had so much. We have so much on our plates today. The World Economic Forum. The World Economic Forum has been pushing for us to change the way we live for a long time. Not only have they pushed for plant-based dietary guidelines, but they've also got another solution. What do you know, guys? They've got a solution for the economy. The economy. They've got a solution for us non-essentials. Where did that go? The World Economic Forum has a solution for us. And it is. It's even better. The world's just going to keep getting better and better. The solution is not, here it goes, the solution is the fourth industrial revolution. The solution is what they call the post-human era. Wired Magazine published that article, was it 1999 or was it 2000, where they said, humans are going to be obsolete, why the future doesn't need us, is what they told us. And right, we've got the World Economic Forum talking about what the future holds for us people. Hotels must learn from hospitals for the new reality of tourism. Right, so rolling in this idea that everything is going to have to be uh, tested, tracked, and traced everywhere. All of our movement, our biology, everything inside of us is going to be tested, tracked, and traced all over the place, and hospitals and hotels are going to have to change their standards. How do you think this is going to affect small family producers of things like meat? How do you think this is going to affect the producers' food? These new standards and what they're trying to say is the new normal. It's so good and it's so helpful and it's going to save all the people. And it's going to feed all the plebs, the beautiful plant-based alternatives, and Ellen lab-grown salami. So you can eat Bono's stir-fried testicles from lab-grown lab Bono testes. The safety of your employees comes first. We've got to create an incident command center in hotels, cleaning protocols, universal precautions and trainings. 
universalizing, all this stuff, and of course, invest in technology. They want to move towards low-touch experiences. And what does that mean, low-touch experiences? This means like freaking Blade Runner 2049 world. They're talking about the fourth industrial revolution where you've got AI systems that are monitoring your behavior, predicting your behavior, telling you what you need, what you want, and what you will receive. <laughs> like when he walks into his apartment and his coffin apartment in Blade Runner, then the new Blade Runner reboot with uh, uh, Gosling, Ryan Goosling, and he walks in there and his girlfriend, who is an AI mass-produced, basically Siri, his girlfriend Siri, gives him his food and it's the bowl of plant-based kibble and bugs. And it's like slop, but projected onto it, it looks like it's real meat. <laughs> it gets a real meat projection on top of it. Low touch experiences. You don't get to touch doorknobs anymore because you're dirty. Your hands are so dirty. We have to be afraid of touching things. You can't hug people. You can't touch people's hands. And they've already got so many people so hypochondriac that people are thinking this is a great idea. Investigate the science of air filtration and aerosol transmission. Mm hmm. That's yeah, so just constantly purifying everything. This idea that science, the priesthood of science is going to purify the world for you. All right, so instead of you know, purifying you internally, they're talking about purifying your cells, purifying the external world, clean the outside of the vessel. Track recommendations as they develop for when individuals are safe. Ah, so they're talking about antibody testing, right? Ultimately, travel certificate says the World Economic Forum. This is what they want us to have. The fourth industrial revolution is what's gonna bring this about. The backbone of the fourth industrial revolution is surveillance, surveillance of all your devices. They're telling us we need this 5G system because we need to connect the internet of things together and have all these things communicating all over the place, giving data and information about us so that we can be controlled, so that our, predict our, our behaviors can be predicted and influenced and the social credit system is gonna bait a lot of people into thinking that this is a great idea. You're gonna get your universal basic income, you get your free Pornhub subscription, and if you listen to enough Joe Rogan and you eat your plant-based kibble and you watch Klaus from Plant Based News, then you will get your social credits. So you've got the fourth industrial revolution, Forbes magazine, AI, machine learning, this is what it's about, internet of things, big data blockchain. This is what it's about. So this is why they're telling you that, oh, look at this, blockchain's gonna save the world, blockchain technology. If you just put more money in my Bitcoins, you're gonna save the planet. No, it's about tracking everything. It's about permanent records. Everything you do will go on your permanent blockchain record. Oh, well, robots and cobots do the real work and we're gonna live in this utopia, right? Where just autonomous vehicles will drive us everywhere. But if you're naughty, maybe if you like the wrong things, if you don't help contact tracing, right? If you don't do your contact tracing duties, which is soon gonna be implemented for other behaviors, right? Like people asking questions, pesky little people asking questions. If you don't do that, if you don't ask the right questions, or if you do ask the wrong questions, you don't say the right things. If you're, I mean, we, we talked about the, um, the integration of these devices with our biology. We talked about, we talked about cryptocurrency, the W, the world, what was it? The uh, world patent number 2026606 by Bill Gates and Microsoft, by Microsoft, which Bill Gates, he, he doesn't work there anymore. So it's not Bill Gates, guys. Snopes said it's not Bill Gates. Talk about tracking your biology and monitoring you constantly and monitoring your vital signs for cryptocurrency. And so this is why the 5G network is necessary. This is why they're talking about the important, look at this, genomics and gene editing, gene editing, right? Upgrade your DNA. That's what it's all about. You, know, you got Forbes magazine, you've got Wired, a lot of these big globalist publications are talking about all this stuff. They want to replace our ability to produce our own food with our ability to basically just sit down, shut up, and listen to the propaganda that's fed to us. And that's what we get if we submit. You get 
total surveillance control grid. You get to live like the communist Chinese slaves. If we continue to go down this line and continue to submit to this constant terror storm from media. <sighs> Excuse me, that was a fake sneeze. What I'm doing there is I'm helping you, I'm helping to train you. I'm making sure that all of you watching here, if you saw me sneeze, I'm making sure that you all report. Make sure that you all report me and snitch properly and contact trace me. Illegal sneeze. <laughs> All right, so this is what they got coming down the line. All right, but all these vegan activists, they're just cheering this on. Plant-based news is digging it. So let's, let's check in on Klaus from Plant-based news for a minute. Let's see what Plant-based news has to say. All right, toxically masculine Klaus. Plant-based news, excuse me, plant-based news, is owned by Prince Khalid He's the son of a Saudi prince, bin al-Walid bin Talal. One of the richest men in the world, one of the major shareholders in Twitter. These people are majorly invested in, guess what, the fourth industrial revolution. We've been talking about this for years. The fourth industrial revolution, lab-grown meat, artificial meat, and vegan activism is part of his portfolio. And guess what the cheapest one of those is to buy? Guess who the cheapest hoes are to buy? People like Klaus and Flam Base News. Let's hear what they gotta say. Hey everybody, I'm Klaus. Hi, Robbie here. We wanna say we hope you're doing well and staying as mentally and physically healthy as possible during these challenging times. The circumstances that we now find ourselves in are truly unprecedented and many small businesses are struggling financially, including us. This is why we're reaching out to ask. They're a small business bankrolled by Prince Khalid, bin al Walid bin Talal. Maybe he stopped giving him money, right? But it just shows you, and I told Klaus this when I talked to him. I told him this from the beginning. Look how cheaply you're, <laughs> you were bought. All these people have to do is give you a few thousand bucks and you'll hoe for their agenda for months, for years. But maybe the money dried up. Maybe Prince Khalid isn't paying up anymore, but they need your money, guys. It's truly unprecedented. They need your money so that they can continue to make throwaway content called plant-based news. They don't, they, the big money interests don't even have to pay these people. These people, these useful idiots, will do it on their own for quarters, for pennies, for a little Beyond Burgers snacks. <laughs> ...that we now find ourselves in are truly unprecedented. And many small businesses are struggling financially, including us. This is why we're I thought you were activists. I thought you, I didn't know you were a business. I thought y'all were activists. Ask you for help. Even if just 1% of our audience gave just $3, it would help keep plant-based news running. Plant-based news. Plant-based news. Whether it's creating content for social media, including YouTube, Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, and Pinterest. I mean, we really are heading into a plant-based revolution. We're going to be looking at a very, very different world in about five years. We're publishing articles on our website. Wow. Wow. And helping our amazing charity partners all over the world. Our team is working around the clock to keep the service running, and we can't do it without your help. Please consider supporting us and help us keep our free service going. Demand for meat free food increased by nearly a thousand percent last year. You know, the evidence is clear. Uh, the, the future is definitely plant based. There's no stereotype. That's the owner right there. This is the guy who owns plant based news. That's Prince Khalid, right? So here's, let's look up Prince Khalid. Oops, I threw, I threw you in there. Here's Prince Khalid. He's a philanthropist. Oh, no, I'm sorry. He's not, he's not powerful enough to be a philanthropist yet. His father is a philanthropist. <laughs> His father is a philanthropist. You can't be a philanthropist unless you've been like... The, the cutoff point when you can call yourself a philanthropist is once you've been accused of human trafficking, <laughs> like multiple people. So his father can be called a philanthropist. Khalid bin Al-Walid bin Talal is the young one. He's an entrepreneur, a prince of the House of Saud. This dude... Owner of Plant Based News, PBN co-owner, Prince Khalid. 
to open animal free sea life experiences in Saudi Arabia. <laughs> it's like, what is it going to give you? Like VR. VR. You can go snuggle a dolphin in VR from Prince Khalid's amazing philanthropy. Um, so he's the founder of KBW Investments. He was a major investor in Beyond Meat, also in Square Inc., owned by Jack Dorsey. Memphis Meats as well, but also a major investor in a lot of uh, fourth industrial revolution stuff. So KBW Ventures, we've covered this before. But the, it's funny, they show their co-owner while they're asking for money. It's, it just it reminds me of these like pimps in places like India where they have all these kids that they base that they make go out and beg for money and then bring back to these like abusive crazy psychopaths who go like they give they give these kids nothing they barely feed them and keep them alive and they force them to go out and beg for money <laughs> on the plant base there's no stereotype anymore now more and more people are cutting out meat and dairy products and adopting a plant-based diet plant-based diet if you are able to help click the link in the description below or check out plantbasednews.org forward slash <laughs> smiles oh they're changing the world let's, let's check it out support our work and then you can check out their vegan pregnancy guide <laughs> vegan pregnancy guide Jody Draws, what's up? Send in a super chat. Appreciate that. Jody Draws says, since the Soy Boys wanted $3, you get it instead. Well, thank you. That's going to go directly to producing more animal foods. <laughs> That's going to go directly to our little family farm here. Where we produce good quality food to feed ourselves and our neighbors. <laughs> and that's going to get put into discrediting all these goose. They're trying to destroy our ability to live off of our own land. To support our families. Evan Gray sends $1.99. Why does Bill want formal disease surveillance? Does, do you think that's all he wants? It's not just formal disease surveillance. It's surveillance of everybody, right? I mean, and Bill, Gil Bates is, he represents huge amounts of money that are funneled through his so-called philanthropy, right? Just like the Rockefeller Foundation, the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation is a massive shell game. It's basically, it's, it's a tax-free hedge fund. For investing in and hiding money, for influencing governments, for paying people off, it's it's really it's a uh, it's big business. So it's all about bringing in fourth industrial revolution surveillance technology, which is planned to be leveraged to create essentially a brave new world Blade Runner twenty forty nine type situation. That's what's up. That's what they want. So let's uh, wait. Let's see where plant based news. How do we contribute? Where'd you go? Yeah, I'm gonna go to the site. So let's see what Plant Based News has to say about it. Thank you so much. Thank you so much for the spacing. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Thank you so much for the spacing. I just wanna see Klaus's smile again, I love it. Yeah. <laughs> All right. <laughs> this is goofy, right? All right, so let's see what's up. How can we support plant-based news? Already owned by one of the, like, the biggest hedge fund managers, Saudi royal family money. They're not even, they don't even have, you guys got to figure out. You guys have the Saudi royal money, and you can't even... There you go. Okay. So you can give three pounds, five pounds, 10 pounds, 50 pounds, 100 pounds, 500 pounds. Let's give a million. Uh, let's give I want to give three three sets of pounds. Three sets of three sets of zeros plus a one and write you a comment. Let's do that monthly. Million pounds monthly. Let's see how do we this field is required. <laughs> Tell Prince Khalid we all thank him for his service. So many exclamation points. All right. So let's tell Prince Khalid we all thank him for his service. Uh, next, get all the updates for sure. I gotta get some plant-based news updates. Um, you can just send that to um, Joey at Joey Carbstrong 
at gmail.com. Let's join. Subscription confirmed. There we go. All right, so there we go. Million dollars monthly. They're stoked. <laughs> you guys make sure you guys make sure to support plant based news. Plant based news. You can make a generous donation. I didn't even have to put in PayPal information or anything to make a million dollar donation to Plum Base News. Look at that. Look at the sheep. Thank you, double entendre there. Thank you, Plant Base News. Thank you. Um, what can you expect? Animal agriculture branded leading cause of climate change in new reports. Well, thank you guys. I'm, I'm glad I could support million dollars monthly going to Plant Base News. But look at this. We've got, oh no, eating meat may improve mental health and one in three vegetarians are depressed, study says. Study suggests. <laughs> what is going on here? Vegetarians are more likely to suffer from depression than meat eaters, study suggests. I mean, you could go on YouTube right now and check out all the miserable vegans out there. All these miserable soya out there that are totally, completely <laughs> depressed, anxious, hangry, right? I mean, you see it all over YouTube, the misery that veganism brings to people. You see the misery in these vegan activists' eyes. But we need a study to tell us that starving yourself of animal foods, of the only essential foods, screws you up mentally. And so, but also lockdowns. What is, what, is, what is locking people on house arrest and telling them that they're dirty, nasty, virus-ridden, CO2 off-gassing scum who need to be eliminated due to people mentally, physically, and due to their health? Come on. Come on, guys. Right, meat eaters tend to have better psychological health than vegetarians. We needed a study to tell us this. <laughs> we needed a study. All right. We, hey, we got another super chat. LBC Ulrika sent in 20 bucks. Thank you, LBC. Says, thank you for all the knowledge and, and for bringing us all together. We must stand and fight now. That's what's up. Look, Because this is what's coming. They're trying to bottleneck the most important source of nutrition for us. The only foods that we need are being made more expensive. Artificially, they don't need to be more expensive. If you buy a cow directly from a rancher and you slaughter it yourself, with friends and family, if you've got people, you've got friends who've got like a, a nice yard, a couple acres or something, why not go buy a calf or just buy a sheep or a goat? Start out small. Slaughter that at your own home and have your own meat for months for much cheaper than you're going to buy it from some middleman. Then you're going to buy it from, you know, people like Butcher Box who are importing beef from Australia to the U.S. I mean, Butcher Box isn't even sending stuff out anymore. Isn't that funny? I mean, we stop, I don't hate Butcher Box. It's the system that enables that to exist, that's the problem. Sure, they might have good beef, but shouldn't Australians be able to get their grass-fed beef for a reasonable price? Why should you buy Australian beef from broke, dark, and handsome, from Fwank to Fainal? Why should you buy grass-fed beef from Australia, allegedly from him, instead of just buying it directly from a producer locally? Come on, guys. And we don't have to submit to this nonsense. We don't have to buy into this, oh, meat is bad, humans are bad. We don't have to buy into this social engineering. We don't have to submit. Vegetarians are more likely to suffer from psychological disorder than meat eaters, study says. So the critical reviews in food science and nutrition suggest that non-meat eaters are more likely to experience psychological problems. I mean, we could have just looked at vegan gains. We could have just looked at Joey Carbstrong and seeing exactly what's happened, All right? People are being made sick, not just by the diets that they're eating, but also by the toxic weaponized pop culture and media that they're receiving, All right? And they're given this false religion of eco-warriorhood, right? They think they're gonna become eco-warriors, warriors for the planet by starving themselves. And by giving you a vegan pregnancy guide. Where'd that vegan pregnancy guy go? Did we jerk? I don't think we pulled that one up. But <laughs> come on. There are solutions. Guys like Greg Judy is teaching, are, are teaching people how to produce their own meat off of leased land where you can lease land dirt cheap. You can lease land in the U.S. way cheaper than I could rent land to run cows on here. Isn't that crazy? You can lease land in the U.S. in a lot of these areas for very, very cheap. Get some animals put up an electric fencing system and regenerate that land. 
regenerate that land, produce food for your family, for your neighbors, make money, and then be able to buy that land later with the money that you made. With minimal input, without having to take out huge bank loans, you can do that. You can do that. You could feed your family. If you're not ready for that, you don't have to do it. Like I said before, you could slaughter an animal at home. You could feed your family, feed your neighbors, go in on a, on a cow. Right? You can buy half a cow that's already slaughtered and processed for you. You can buy directly from the farms instead of supporting the mass-produced kibble. Right? So we don't have to be affected by these meat shortages, which are not really meat shortages. There's plenty of meat in the U.S. It's just the inability of the producer to get it to the consumer that we're dealing with. And we don't have to submit to this stuff. Ulrika says you can also pay someone to butcher for you if you can't do it. I had a hard time doing such a thing because I broke my neck and can't lift heavy things. Exactly. You could pay someone to butcher it for you. And you can get that meat directly. I mean, people are going to have to go to like speakeasies to get their meat if this stuff continues. But this doesn't have to be. We don't have to be doing this. All right, let me see. Let me come over here to the chat and see what's going on here. And then I think we might wrap it up. I'll have to do another stream. Maybe I'll do another one to, uh, let's see. Maybe I'll do another one tomorrow. So uh, if, you, if you want some support, if you want to be in a community of like-minded people who are there to support you, check out the link in the description down below. You can join our private members forum. Join the inner circle there. We're doing a coaching call on Friday. So we've got a lot of like-minded people, a lot of really awesome people up there. I'm pulling up the, uh, pulling up the private forum right now. It's just, it's always popping. There's really cool people in here. Um, actually, Tommy, Tommy Kelly, formerly Tofu Tommy, is a member here. So this is a way that you can both support our work, but then also support yourself and have people to hold you accountable. And if you need advice or help formulating your diet and helping you with your lifestyle, your coaches, myself and Jessica are here for you. A lot of people ask if Jessica, I mean, a lot of people on Instagram especially because we do some lives on Instagram. People love input from Jessica. People ask if she does coaching. I do private coaching. Jessica doesn't do so much of that, but she does do a lot of coaching through our private members forum. So that's the best way to reach her there. We've got a lot of homesteaders in there. A lot of people who are just taking steps like starting their own little chicken coops. A lot of people who are even, we've got several members who they've inspired me because they're now taking the, uh, the big steps to move to the country to get out of the cities, even during these lockdowns. So I've got people who are moving to the country to start doing the, uh, the homesteading lifestyle right now, right? Because this is not the time to sit down and just wait for governments to tell us, oh, it's okay to live again. Oh, Bill Gates has found a fake cure. We shouldn't just be sitting around and waiting for our cues from media, from social media. We should be building. We should be building a solid foundation of real habits that are gonna help ourselves to be resilient to be healthy, so that our families can be healthy and resilient, so we can have healthy, resilient communities and not just have to sit around and wait for cues from the freaking media. We got Aaron in the chat here, starting a quarter acre homestead. You can have a lot of food produced on a small amount. A lot of food produced on a small amount of land. Like a quarter acre, you can have quite a bit of food. You can even have some goats or sheep, depending on the area. You're probably not gonna want cows on a small land, although there are people that do and they feed them silage. <laughs> There's a lot of different ways you could go about producing food on your own land. We don't have to be just sitting around, stuffing our faces at home, eating the plant-based kibble. We should be building up our health and our resilience. All right, so it's not that complicated. It's not that hard to be healthy. <laughs> if we eat the foods that we're meant to eat, that can eliminate a lot of the metabolic issues that can make us more vulnerable to disease, that can make us more vulnerable to infection, that can shorten our lifespan. You know, we can avoid having insulin resistance by simply eating enough good quality animal foods that'll satiate and help us to maintain stable energy level throughout the day. If you've got a lot of body fat to lose and you focus on the essentials, the good quality animal foods, the foods that improve your mental health and you avoid the kibble. You're going to feel better. You're going to get improved body composition. You're going to get reduced hunger. So we don't need to be sitting around waiting for somebody to do it for us. It's time to take action, guys. All right, so we appreciate all the support you guys have given during the stream. We appreciate all the super chats. Thanks, guys, for hanging out. Become a member of the Inner Circle at PrimalEdgeHealth.com. 
There's a link down in the description below. Support local producers. Buy your food directly from the source and cut out these middlemen that are fleecing you and taking all the profits. They're taking the profits from the farmers. They're taking the, uh, the, the food from the farmers, marking it up astronomically. And the farmers are making less, the producers are making less, and we're paying more. We're paying more. So we got to stop buying food from middlemen, cut out the middlemen, maybe even start producing food ourselves. Not all of us need to. But we can't. We got a super chat here, though. There we go. I was about to end it. We had another super chat. Hey, you guys, th thank you for reminding me. Sometimes I miss them, and I appreciate all these. We got Rolf Kraus since four ninety nine. Says I've been brewing some high meat for two months, but I haven't nutted up to try it yet. How long is optimal? And do you need to let it air out often? You know, when you're making high meat, usually like once a week, opening it up can be pretty useful. I'd say wait like three to four months. Stir it every once in a while. You can even shake it, open it up. You're gonna and do the smell test. Eventually, you'll you'll be you'll you'll think it smells really appetizing, and you'll want to try it. And just take a small bite. Just take a small bite. I love high meat. I haven't had high meat in a long time. But I've been, people have been asking me about it, and I've been almost I've been kind of starting to crave it. There was a time when I was eating a lot of liver, and I didn't eat any liver for a while. But I've been having liver regularly lately. Just doing liver patties, right? We grind up the liver. We get it ground up from the butcher. Just like ground beef is ground up. You grind up the liver. You can even do it in a food processor. It's really wet. It's kind of sloppy. Like a, I don't know, it almost feels like a, like a sloppy joe or something like that. But we grind up the liver and we turn it into a patty. Pull that down. And, and I just cook it like a burger. It's really good. So when I, when I have like a real simple meal that's super affordable, we'll get ground up brisket, gris, brisket. All right, now I'm connected again. Anyways, I don't know when I cut out, but I really enjoy that. I know that's a way I've been eating liver. But I've been thinking about high liver. Somebody commented, sent me a link to my high liver video, <laughs> and, um, and I saw the thumbnail, and it started getting me hungry for high liver, so I might have to make some of that soon. Uh, but there are a lot of different ways that you can get in. You don't have to make high liver. That's not like for everybody. Only for the very brave. The brave aficionados are going to go that far. But there are a lot of ways of making animal foods very affordable. And using the whole animal is a way you can do that. We should all be doing that. right? And now that you're creating this bottleneck and making it harder for us to get beef, if you're purchasing directly from a producer or if you're slaughtering your own animals, which I encourage people to do, you're going to want to use the whole thing. So check out the carnivore cookbook, Jessica's book here. She doesn't come on YouTube much because YouTube is YouTube's brutal. She knows it. <laughs> she comes up on Instagram sometimes. We got the carnivore cookbook, zero carb recipes for people who really love animals. We got a whole section on nose to tail stuff. We show you how to make the cheaper, more affordable cuts. I mean, people, we recommend that you try out things like, I mean, tongue is really, really good. Lengua in Spanish. If you live here, that's more expensive. It's more sought after. If you live here, organ meats are more expensive, right? People want the kidneys. People want the liver. The liver sells first here because people know what's up. It's funny. It's the opposite of the U.S. where people just want the muscle meat. So we've got to do a little more, we've got to have a little more creativity when we're preparing foods these days. You know, we've got to be able to source locally and that's going to help to get rid of this bottleneck that's screwing our ability to get good foods. All right, so try, try out some new stuff, guys. You'd be surprised at how good things are. I mean, we, we really like cheek. Beef cheek is really good and it's so cheap. Here it's even cheap because nobody even wants it here. But she gives us like the whole jaw. So we make broth out of it. And there's so much fat in there. There's so much fat in the cheek around the tongue area. The tongue is very fatty as well. We really like it. Langua. There you go. Tyler Sutton knows what's up. He must be from California. He's eating Langua tacos. You know, heart. Really affordable as well. Beef heart. Not beef farts. Or beef farts. <laughs> beef heart. Really cheap compared to other cuts. So things like, I mean, we've got a cool recipe for... Um, it's an organ meat pie. It's basically beef heart, beef liver. There you go. Oh, there's a, this one's really good. Just beef heart pizza here. That one's really good. That's a simple one. There's another one we make. It's beef heart, beef liver. You could do like 25% liver, 25% heart, 50% beef. Or you could do even less of the, uh, the liver and heart. And you use eggs and you basically make a bake. You bake it. It's really easy. We make that 
a couple times a week. The kids were just having that for breakfast, right? Super affordable. So check out the carnivore cookbook for ideas or check out the website primaledgehealth.com. We got a bunch of awesome free recipes up there and you can get a sample of the carnivore cookbook. There's a link down in the description. Become a member, primaledgehealth.com. Thank you so much for the super chats, guys. Thanks for kicking it. Thanks for hanging out, all you biggest. Now go out there, get off the freaking computer, get outside, get some vitamin D. Go talk to your freaking neighbors. Quit muzzling yourself on all levels. Get out in the real world and live your damn life. Peace, guys. What ups, reflections? I am not a bigot. I am ready to save the planet by doing exactly what the big banks tell the TV screens to tell us to do. I feel so empowered on my hashtag vegan journey. Join us as we chant empty slogans for hashtag climate action ridden by PR firms. We need to save the earth and demand a global totalitarian technocratic government run by big finance and the fortune 100. Our house is on fire and we need the nice grown-up government to take everyone's land and resources and ration us delicious sustainable nutrient fortified vegan kibble. This is an emergency. Mommy Earth is crying so sad because she wants the mean grown-ups to give poor little 16-year-old human shield Greta her future back. Uh, do you have anything to add to these debates about, about just the, in particular the idea that it's kind of too expensive to deal with climate change? I mean, it is... The money is there. If we can save the banks, if, then we can save the world. <laughs> I mean... Jeffrey Epstein committed suicides and was working alone. Veganism is desirable and fun and make me smile big happy on my insides. I, mean, I do not this... hate children. I am not a science denier. I do like science. To fix the hashtag climate crisis we need to sterilize ourselves, starve ourselves, eat babies and grandma and move to a social engineered hashtag smart city to save the earth. There is no time to examine the inconsistencies in our claims or actions or the billions of dollars being leveraged to brainwash us into thinking we want this. We want hashtag climate action now and a hashtag plant based food system of sustainable fortified kibble. We are not being used. We are truly empowered and full of energy that we are using constructively. We are so empowered and not deceived. We all share the same values, so we just need to align those values with our actions and join forces. We all want the same thing. We want to see an Earth in the next 50 years. The money is there. If we can save the banks, if, then we can save the world. <laughs> I mean...